Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's New York remote New York City Council hearing of the Committee on Higher Education. At this time, would all panelists please turn on their video? Again, at this time, would all panelists please turn on their video? To minimize disruption, please place electronic devices to vibrate or silent. If you wish to submit testimony, you may do so at testimony at council.nyc.gov. Again, that's testimony at council.nyc.gov. Thank you for your cooperation. We are ready to begin. Good morning and welcome to today's oversight hearing on the impact of coronavirus COVID-19 on the City University of New York. I am Council Member Ines Barron, Chair of the Committee on Higher Education and a proud CUNY alum. First, I want to acknowledge that this is the first higher education hearing since the COVID-19 pandemic turned many of our lives upside down, took many lives, and bear the racial inequities that have always existed in New York City and indeed throughout this nation. Latest available data on COVID-19 related death rates in each of the city's zip codes show that while the majority of deaths have been older residents, race and income have proven to be the largest factors determining who lives and who dies. Though the city may have identified, though the city may has identified a coronavirus epidemic, neighborhoods with majority black and Latino New Yorkers, as well as low income residents suffered the highest death rates while some wealthier areas, predominantly white, suffered almost no deaths. This is personal and it has devastated my Brooklyn district, which includes the zip code with the highest death rate in the city. So notwithstanding the data that the elderly and those who are black and Latino were at the highest risk for contracting and dying from this virus, the governor did not see fit to make adequate provisions to protect those communities and send the resources there. And that is a state there. Today, 17 days after George Floyd, a 46 year old unarmed black man was publicly choked to death by a Minneapolis police officer in a way that immediately brought to mind the 2014 murder of Eric Garner a 43-year-old unarmed Black man by NYPD officer, uh, the continued discriminatory treatment of Black and Brown people by the police caught on tape has doubly laid bare the inequities that again have always existed in New York City. And lest we forget, police officer Daniel Pantaleo was only fired from the MPD and stripped of his pension benefits less than a year ago, five years after Mr. Garner uttered his dying words, I can't breathe. And there are many countless others here in New York City, unarmed, who have died at the hands of the NYPD. And I'm going to call their names, these are just some of them. Anthony Baez, Mohamed Ba, Sean Bell, John Collado, Deborah Dana, Amadou Diallo, Malcolm Ferguson, Randy Evans, Clifford Glover, 10 year old Clifford Glover, Eric Garner, Ramali Graham, Nicholas Haywood Jr., also a child, a minor, Delron Small, and Saheed Vassal, unarmed people shot, killed by NYPD. And I must include Ortanza Bavel, shot in the back by Officer Shell, who was able to rise through the ranks and become chief. Daily demonstrations have since broken out across the city and the country driven by these events and the deaths of numerous other black people of color and indigenous people in and elevating a national discussion on police use of force and other law enforcement tactics that disproportionately impact non-white people, people of color, black, Latino. However, these peaceful protests have once again showcased the lawlessness of those who are sworn to serve and protect us. 
And it is only because of these protests, I believe, that we've been able to get the results that we are now beginning to see percolate. And that's because of people in the street protesting. Once again, we must stand up and remind leadership that Black Lives Matter. And this does not stop at adding a hashtag to our social media account. We must demand real investment in Black and Brown communities. New York is one of the most culturally diverse cities in the country. And along with many of its great institutions, such as CUNY, New York City is the greatest city in the world, not in spite of its diversity, but because of it. CUNY has established with explicit legislation intents that identify the university being of quote, vital importance as a vehicle for the upward mobility of the disadvantaged in the city of New York. Now the largest urban public university in the country, CUNY serves more than 247,000 degree seeking and 276,000 adult and continuing education students at 25 campuses across the five boroughs. And certainly CUNY's undergraduate student population more, than, more, uh, more or less reflects the diversity of the city through its faculty and some of its leadership, but not enough. History shows that in times of economic downturns and in periods of high unemployment, there tends to be an increase in the enrollment at particularly community colleges. However, we have all learned, or we've all heard about the cuts that are planned to courses, to faculty, and to programs, including CUNY ASAP, which has won prestigious innovations in American Government Award from Harvard's John F. Kennedy School of Government this past April. And as a relatively affordable path into the middle class for low income students, it is crucial that CUNY critically consider how it will reopen and continue to be an economic engine for the city. In addition to ensuring the health, health and safety of the CUNY committed community as they return to campus, it is imperative that the university explicitly commits to serving the underserved, especially black and brown New Yorkers through degree completion. It is also critical that the city put the appropriate funding into CUNY to maintain its programs. As a black member of the New York City Council, chair of the Committee on Higher Education and member of the Black, Latino and Asian Caucus, I am committed to fighting educational inequities and ensuring that CUNY better serves is black, Latino, people of color students. And indeed, $1 billion in the NYD, NYPD budget can be better spent. And I would encourage us not to scrap over the pennies and have them pit one organization or agency or program against another, but to be able to understand that we can adequately fund our. I would like to thank Joy Simmons, my chief of staff, Indigo Washington, my CUNY liaison and director of legislation, Chloe Rivera, the committee senior policy analyst, Paul Senegal, counsel to the committee, and Monica Peregrin, the committee's new finance analyst. And now I will ask that the uh, council take over and call the first panel. Thank you, Chair Barron. Before calling the first panel, I'm going to review some rules. Uh, my name is Paul Senegal. I'm counsel to the Committee on Higher Education of the New York City Council. I'll be moderating today's hearing and calling panelists to testify. Before we begin, I want to remind everyone that you will be on mute until I call on you to testify. After you are called on, you will be unmuted by the host. Please listen for your name. I will periodically announce who the next panelists will be. Council members' questions will be limited to five minutes. And council members, please note that this includes both your question and the witness's answer. Please also note that we will allow a second round of questions at today's hearing. These will be limited to two minutes, again, including both your question and the witness's answer. For public testimony, I will call up individuals in panels of three or four. Council members who have questions for a particular panelist should use the raise hand function in Zoom. 
you will be called on after everyone on that panel has completed their testimony. For public panelists, once I call your name, a member of our staff will unmute you and the Sergeant at Arms will give you the go ahead to begin speaking after setting the timer. All public testimony will be limited to three minutes. After I call your name, please wait a brief moment for the Sergeant at Arms to announce that you may begin before starting your testimony. I will now call the first panel to testify. The first panel in order of speaking will be Timothy Hunter, President, University Student Senate, Ali Haider Hassan, Vice Chair of Evening and Part-Time Student Affairs, University Student Senate, and Melanie, Melanie Cruvellas, Senior Manager of Policy and Advocacy at Young Invincibles. Your time begins now. Timothy, you may begin. It's definitely uh, great to, to see that our council is uh, council members definitely out there. We appear to be having some technical difficulties right now. Um, if we're able to resolve those, we'll circle back to you, Timothy. Um, in the meantime, we'll move on to Ali Hader Hassan. Time starts now. Good morning. My name is Ali Haider Hassan. I'm the vice chairperson of evening and part-time affairs of CUNY University Student Senate and an academic senator at Queens College City University of New York. Thank you for holding this hearing. The City University of New York, a true gem for the city, known to be the greatest urban university in the world, is lacking proper funding to maintain and offer accessible and quality education to its students. The University Student Senate, founded on the principle of advocacy for all students and achieving a fully funded CUNY, have continuously called on elected officials to increase funding to higher education so that students, especially for those who live in, a po who live in poverty in the most expensive city in the world, can afford an education, higher education. This is, the un this is an unprecedented time. The city has just emerged from being the center of a global pandemic. New York State has seen unemployment rise to almost 2 million within the last three months. Leaving the question, not only are we facing the possibility of increased tuition, when our students have lost their jobs and are facing food insecurity and homelessness, but our students and their families are seeking jobs in an economy that we haven't seen since the Great Depression. How do we expect students to afford this tuition hike? This is a student from BMCC. I'm a student from BMCC and I'm employed there through work study, yet I'm not receiving payments because schools are closed. Many people like me are out of work and I'm spending the little money I have on staying alive. I do not have the money to think about tuition, let alone raise on it. Community colleges, the most afford the more affordable route compared to a senior college here in New York offers one of the highest tuition rates in the nation. As of 2016, 60% of students, CUNY students came from homes with, under, with incomes under $30,000. Part-time and evening students, a lot of the times consists of students who work full-time, who are single mothers and fathers, students who want to prioritize their education, but receive little to no power grants and need to work to afford tuition. These students face one of the greatest threats. This pandemic has left many of them jobless. How do we expect them to continue their education? According to CUNY's data on total enrollment based on fall 2019 shows that BMCC, out of its 25,000 plus students, 7,700 of them are part-time. LaGuardia Community College, out of its total 18,505 students, 8,563 of them are part-time students. If in every community college, part-time students make up almost one third or half of the total students, then how can we even think about raising the tuition at this moment when these students are losing their jobs, are homeless, are facing <coughs> Many students have yet to finish paying off this past semester's tuition, then have to set for next semester while also worrying, save for next semester while also worrying about it increasing. It is time that the council invest and prioritize in our education and I urge the council to allocate $16 million for a tuition freeze at CUNY Community Colleges for the fiscal year 2021. Thank you. Thank you. We will now circle back to Timothy Hunter for his testimony. time starts now. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for waiting for them to speak. 
Um, firstly, I'm for holding this. Um, we've been working very closely with her this past couple of weeks, and it has been a very stressful time, um, not only for us, but for the students all across the university. Um, again, just to introduce myself, my name is Timothy Hunter, chairperson of the university. My name is Timothy Hunter, chairperson of the university student senate. Um, and first, I just want to circle back to the CUNY's mission statement, um, you know, founded in 1972. Um, you know, well, well, we, we have the mission of preserving the excess of USS. We have the mission of preserving the accessibility of affordability of excellence of higher education within CUNY. And it's our job to continue to be fierce advocates for that. Um, you know, amidst the COVID-19 pandemic, when we've seen so many students experience uh, a plethora of hardships um, from, you know, the increasing of tuition that could potentially happen um, at the end of this year um, to losing jobs and income um, to many of our students being frontline workers. And as Ali, uh, my colleague has highlighted, it's super important that the council considers not increasing tuition this year and allocating the proper money that's needed. $16 million is not a huge ask for a city that has one of the largest budgets and a budget that is larger than, than some of the states. And especially where the pressure is coming from a lot of uh, the people to make sure that we're you know, cutting you know, funding to the New York Police Department and making sure that we're investing in education. Um, we have collected even like as COVID has kind of started, um, 1,600 testimonies from students all across our university and some alumni um, kind of calling on the Board of Trustees to make sure that they freeze tuition this year. Um, many of these students have paid out of pocket their whole entire life or many of them are international students and they don't know how they're going to make ends meet um, because they have been like laid off of their jobs or their parents aren't working or they had to head back home to make sure that their family was okay and that their family wasn't sick. Um, I don't think that it's right for these students to have to pay extra money for their tuition and I think that you know the council should, should definitely consider Unfortunately, it seems like we've lost Mr. Hunter. Um, if we're able to resolve um, the technical difficulties, we'll circle back to you and let you finish your statement. Um, in the meantime, we will move on to uh, Ms. Melanie Kubelis, Senior Manager of Policy and Advocacy, Young Invincibles. Time starts now. Great, thank you very much, Paul. Good morning, everyone. My name is Melanie Kubelis, and I'm Senior Manager of Policy and Advocacy at Young Invincibles. I wanna thank the council and the Committee on Higher Education for the opportunity to testify today. CUNY faced serious challenges when the COVID-19 pandemic took hold in New York, you know, transitioning from a system of 25 physical campuses to distance learning and virtual support services was daunting. Uh, and in conversations with CUNY students, many recognized the challenges that their campuses faced during this transition. As one city college told us, uh, as one city college student told us this spring, although I'm grateful that the universities throughout New York are doing what they can to prevent the spread of COVID, I also realized that there's an added layer of uncertainty and stress that I actively have to deal with. How will I attend online classes when my internet connection isn't always stable? We do recognize that CUNY responded to these issues, publishing campus level points of contact on CUNY central websites to connect students with laptops and tablets. Still, even as CUNY adapted to this digital environment, we know that many students ended the semester without inter adequate internet access. This includes students who are most vulnerable to the pandemic, including the 14% of CUNY students experiencing homelessness. We spoke with a Lehman College student living in one of the city's homeless shelters who was prohibited from using her laptop in the shelter or accessing its Wi-Fi. We heard from students living in crowded housing conditions, uh, which impacted their ability to access internet and focus. Recent surveys fielded by Healthy CUNY also show further challenges of distance learning, from the caretaking responsibility of CUNY student parents to unaddressed issues for students with different learning abilities. In short, these issues that emerged uh, as CUNY went online go beyond simply ensuring laptops and internet access. These are intersectional issues that underscore which students are able to access higher ed and those who are left behind to figure it out for themselves. Now, as more New Yorkers emerge from this pandemic on the brink of eviction and homelessness with rising food insecurity and serious mental health challenges, CUNY must step up its communication and collaboration with services on and off campus that can help students address these issues. We hosted a roundtable with CUNY students earlier this spring asking how COVID uh, impacted their semester. When asked about the communication they received from their campuses, they said they heard a lot uh, about the transition to online learning and Blackboard, but few had received information about food pantries, single stop services, or accessing emergency aid. It's time to step up coordination and communication with these services. We need to see digital CUNY-wide platforms that connect students to basic needs assistance. We need CUNY-wide campaigns aimed at enrolling eligible students in SNAP, Medicaid, and other services. And we also need CUNY to keep an eye on the rising housing insecurity that students face. Students are frustrated by the lack of support they receive when it comes to securing affordable housing. 
CUNY must strengthen its communication and collaboration with the city's housing system, including shelters, housing providers, and philanthropic partners who all have a role in making sure students have safe, stable places to sleep at night. And when our systems fail and leave students without housing, we cannot turn our back on these students. We must do everything we can to make sure they're safe and housed. In other states like California, Maine, Louisiana, colleges created on-campus liaisons for students experiencing homelessness who can manage these relationships with housing systems and ensure that the issue the Lehman College student faced do not happen. As we move forward- Thanks, they hard. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Cruellis. Um, Timothy, are you able to finish your testimony? If not, I'd like to remind you that you may submit your written testimony online. Um, I believe you already have submitted something. Um, but in the meantime, we will turn back to Chair Barron for any questions for this panel. Uh, thank you, Mrs. Senegal. Uh, I do have questions for the panel. First of all, thank you for coming. And we wanted to make sure that we gave you the opportunity to present your testimony first, because we wanted you to set the platform for what we want to have CUNY respond to. So my question will be directed uh, to Mr. Alahadir. I hope I'm not saying too badly. And I wanted to ask you, what is USSC in terms of the need for mental health services as students return to CUNY, as well as supporting them with their food needs? What is USSC in those two areas in particular? Thank you. Chair Barron. Um, so regarding mental health or wellness, wellness, the issue is in most of our community campuses, we don't have enough counselors. The ratio between our counselors and our students is such a huge gap that it takes forever for our students to even see a counselor. There are about, I think there's, for, each, for each counselor, I think there's about a thousand or 2000 students that they see. So the thing is, is that even before this pandemic, we already have, we already had this, this gap of more, we already had this gap of students not being able to see counselors, not be, waiting months for appointments. CUNY needs to have more counselors. CUNY needs to have, we need to invest more into mental health and wellness in our campuses. And they need to, we just, they need the gap between students and counselors need to close. So that way students can see counselors properly in a, in a proper manner of time, not have to wait months. So we would have, we would, CUNY would need more counselors for students. And in terms of food insecurity, which is that polite word of saying hunger, what do you think will be some of the fa challenges facing us moving forward? What so, was it asked? How, how do you think the CUNY system provided uh, meals and food, and what do you think we need to be um, aware of for challenges moving forward? Thank you. Um, so, with for food insecurity, the we need CUNY has, like even the city council and CUNY has tried, have done some to assist students with food insecurity. But the thing is, a lot of our students still face food insecurity, even though we have. Uh, we might have on some campuses, we might have these food pantries, but it's still not enough for these students because these students have, a lot of these students are, don't have, don't have jobs. A lot of these students are come from like under income families, low income families. They could, they could do, they could be, it could be a better job done across the board because students that and especially during this time when students have lost their jobs because of the pandemic and due to the pandemic, we're going to see more students who are going to be in need of food assistance and food assistance throughout campuses. And there are going to be more students who are going to be food insecure. So we would need to see more, more assistance and uh, a better job done across the board of CUNY. Thank you. And uh, if the if the technician could unmute Melanie Provales. I have a question or two for her as well. Melanie, as a young Invincibles uh, has come and spoken to me about what they see as some of the issues, what do you see as some of the challenges in terms of the academic disruption for students because of this coronavirus? Thank you for that question. Yeah, um, you know, I think 
as I think to response to that question, um, I feel like it's so interrelated to even just the last question you asked in terms of food security and mental health and you know some of what I mentioned uh, with the transition to online learning. Um, I think often we think of these challenges as separate from one another, but I think as we you know speak with students and then again as Dr. Freudenberg has found in his survey work, we see how all of these challenge are, challenges are interrelated and can truly impact students' ability to persist from semester to semester. Um, I think, you know, you know, while we applaud some of the decisions around, you know, uh, making pass fail decisions and things like that, uh, that CUNY has made, I think that there are serious challenges for students um, uh, who are trying to persist from semester to semester. Um, and again, I, I do see it uh, very much related to all of those challenges that students are facing. Um, you know, I think we're concerned about um, what happens to students who might, um, you know, not be able to fully participate uh, in school, whether it's because they're now caretaking while at home and, and at school, or whether it's because, um, you know, they're dealing with mental health issues that they don't have enough resources for, and will that impact their ability to uh, maintain financial aid? Um, you know, in upcoming semesters? Um, do we have clarity on whether or not they'll be able to maintain, maintain TAP um, if their academic performance doesn't meet um, yeah. you know, satisfactory academic progress? And that's something that we have been talking with colleagues about on the state side, and we'll continue to have those conversations. Um, just one quick thing I wanted to note on your question on, on mental health and food services. Um, one thing that we recently held a town hall led by some uh, CUNY students on mental health uh, in collaboration with USS. And one thing that came clear to me from that um, is I think there are opportunities as um, we move to telehealth services, but I also really want to center the fact that even if telehealth services are available, uh, they're not always accessible or safe for all students. And so when I say that, I think about students who, um, you know, from different language backgrounds who may not be served by these services or students who, you know, um, LGBTQ students who might not feel safe talking with a counselor over the phone, knowing that someone in their family is right next door in the other room and can hear what they're talking about. And so I think, you know, thinking creatively and multimodally can be really helpful as we make sure that all students um, are able to access these services. So whether it's texting therapy or other things that we can do, we really need to make sure that students who are, you know, again, most vulnerable in this pandemic are really centered in decision-making processes. And, and you speak about telehealth. Uh, mm -hmm. Has that been uh, an opportunity presently or how have we found it working during this interim period and how are students getting informed of whatever it is that the services the CUNY system is offering to them? How are they getting informed? Do you have, have you found that to be efficient and what is the uh, opportunity that we see to make improvements? Absolutely. So thank you for that question. Um, I think in general, one of the things that we have heard from the students that we work with is just, again, as I mentioned in my testimony, just not enough communication from CUNY about sort of these non-academic pieces of their lives. And, you know, again, when I mentioned that roundtable that we held uh, with students, uh, we did, we heard from them that, you know, whether it's mental health, like telehealth services or information about food pantries, um, they really had to like track down a lot of different sources in order to get that information. And so I, I really encourage CUNY um, to, you know, centralize some of that information as much as possible um, and communicate that information to students often and frequently and whether or not that means that you're including the same information in like weekly emails like that's okay, like students need that information and students are gonna have different needs throughout the time. And so whether, you know, one week, maybe that mental health services wasn't something that was on their mind, but maybe something happens where the next week it is. And are we continuing to communicate that um, to students? And, um, you know, again, um, yeah, to your, to your point on, on telehealth, I think, again, centering those, um, those needs of students. Um, again, I think it's a big opportunity, especially as we try to figure out what fall 2020 is gonna look like. But uh, again, I think there's opportunities for CUNY to connect with community-based providers who have already had a long history of serving underserved communities in mental health and connecting them with mental health counselors that actually look like them and like understand their concerns. Um, I think that's a really big opportunity and I'm happy to connect the council with some of the groups that we've met with who could do. And, and finally, in terms of the issue of communication, has CUNY been the source of just sending out blasts through emails of what it is that's happening, or 
does the information have to be initiated by the student to go and to log in and to check the website. So does CUNY either centrally or through the campuses send out blasts and emails and let students know or is it originated from the student? Right, great question. And I would be curious to hear what some of the other current students on this panel think uh, about that question. But from everything that I've heard, I mean, I think I think it's a it's a variety. Um, I think there are instances where CUNY Central is sort of sending out that larger information. I think we saw that with some of the um, emergency grant information, but it is largely a very decentralized by campus um, communication. That's what we've really heard from students. And again, it can really vary widely depending on what campus that you're at and, and what services are available. And so again, I think, as I mentioned in my testimony and, uh, you know, others may bring up, I think there are some real opportunities to centralize some of that information to CUNY so students really know where to access it. And then to have some of these concerted you know, uh, outreach campaigns to make sure that students are, you know, whether it's Medicaid or SNAP or, you know, accessing some of the city's mental health services, we need to make sure that those, um, that's really centered in a lot of the advertising and, and marketing that materials that come out in the next semester. Um, so just some of my thoughts there. Thank you very much. And if Timothy Hunter has been able to get back on, I don't know if he has, but if he has, I'd like to afford him an opportunity to once again try to share his testimony so if there's an opportunity to um, reach out to him in the next 30 seconds to my tech team if we can find out if he is logged back in Councilmember Barry, I believe he is no longer logged in okay um, thank you we'll, we'll allow him the next panel. Um, just wanted to give you an opportunity to recognize yes. your colleagues. Yes. Thank you. I want to recognize that we've been joined by members, uh, Council Member Maisel and Council Member Ulrich, who are both members of this committee. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Barron. I will next call uh, the following members of the administration to testify. Jose Louis Cruz, Senior Vice Chancellor for Academic Affairs, and Matthew Sapienza, Chief Financial Officer. Um, I will first read the oath, and after I will call upon each of you individually to respond. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth before this committee and to respond honestly to council members' questions? Vice Chancellor Cruz? I do. Thank you. Mr. Sapienza? I do. Thank you both. Vice Chancellor Cruz, you may begin your testimony when ready. Thank you. Good afternoon, or good morning, I should say. Chairperson Barron and members of the Higher Education Committee, thank you for the opportunity to testify before you on the impact COVID-19 has had on the City University of New York. My name is Jose Luis Cruz, and I have the privilege of serving as the Executive Vice Chancellor and University Provost of the City University of New York. As we look to the days ahead, we must be guided by the understanding that to fully meet the needs of our students and communities, to truly be engaged in the recovery of New York City and New York State, we must invest in our students and also in the institutions that serve them, because it is crucial that access and affordability be paired with the rigor and value that our students, city, and state require or deserve. Institutions in New York State must work hand in hand because there is no one single agency or institution that predominantly and disproportionately shoulders the responsibility of increasing educational attainment as a means to narrowing gaps in opportunity. There is no one single agency or institution that predominantly and disproportionately paves the way for a more just and equitable society. So we must work better together to recover from the challenges brought about by the pandemic and to be better positioned to adjust to the future disruptions to our ways of life. That is why we greatly value the support that you, Chair Barron, and this committee have historically provided to the City University of New York, both by influencing direct investments to our mission and by holding us accountable to achieving our highest principles. Food, housing, and financial insecurity among our students has inarguably increased at a time when the challenges 
challenges the university faces in tending to them have, of course, soared. This should not be news to anyone who knows how structural oppression and systemic racism, the very issues that CUNY was legislated to combat, work against the students we serve. The reality is that recent internal polling suggests that nearly 40% of our students have lost their jobs. As of May 15, 2020, 18% have reported going hungry at least once in the two weeks previous, and 55% have faced housing insecurity since March 2019. These are unfortunate increases over the appalling conditions we were already facing in the pre-pandemic era. During the pandemic, we have reacted swiftly and forcefully to turn things around. We have had the courage to not avert our gaze from the suffering, but continue to work steadfastly to measure it and address it head on. My colleague, Matt Sapienza, will describe in detail the distribution of over $100 million of CARES Act emergency funding to eligible students using a progressive allocation formula that considers students' financial need and whether or not they have dependents to care for, coupled with a nimble distribution process. Furthermore, he will also report on the Chancellor's Emergency Relief Fund, which has distributed much needed grants to CUNY students who are coping with the severe economic fallout of the extraordinary public health emergency we are all facing. Finally, we're also happy to report that we distributed the full $1 million of the Food Insecurity Pilot Program sponsored by City Council Speaker Corey Johnson. Our seven community colleges participated in the program that provided 441 students $400 for food expenses in both the fall 2019 and spring 2020 semesters. Another 11 154 students received $400 in April 2020 as we modified the program to respond to the needs of our students caused by the COVID-19 pandemic. We also provided our seven community colleges with additional funding for food pantry purchases. And we look forward to additional partnerships to join on these important efforts. I am also pleased to present an update about our enrollment projections and graduation projections, which I know have been on the mind of the chairperson. Regarding enrollment, we recently announced a 16% increase in our projected summer enrollments, even as today these courses are scheduled to be delivered online. While our fall 2020 projections need to be taken with caution, we currently see much better numbers than are being reported by other institutions of higher education across the country. As of this writing, we're projecting an overall reduction of approximately 4.4% for the fall, with the caveat that not all of our colleges have started enrolling for the fall 2020 semester. And we have yet to make an announcement as to the balance of in-person versus online classes and services that we expect next fall. In terms of graduation projections, I am so pleased to state that we expect an estimated 55,000 CUNY graduates to complete their degree requirements this academic year. As we celebrate their accomplishments, many of those online, we continue to turn our attention on the many ways we can best support them as they enter into what is perhaps one of the most difficult job markets in decades. For these and so many other reasons, my outlook today is one actually of great optimism about what lies ahead. My optimism is motivated by a clear understanding that our quest to make CUNY bigger, better, and bolder is now more important than ever. Now is the time to double down and accelerate the advancement of our mission. We must take heed of the lessons before us, the lessons of the inequities with which COVID-19 has wreaked its havoc upon the underserved communities we seek to better serve, and the systemic oppression that took the life of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and too many others. It is that the stakes are too high, and the time to fully deliver on our mission is becoming uncomfortably tight. As such, we need to, be, to bet big, and we need to bet big on CUNY to drive its mission forward. I very much look forward to working with the committee, the students, and the other panelists on making this a reality. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you for your testimony, Vice Chancellor Cruz. Uh, Vice Chancellor uh, Sapienza, uh, you may begin your testimony when ready. Thank you. Good morning, Chairperson Barron and members of the Higher Education Committee. 
I am Matthew Sapienza, CUNY Senior Vice Chancellor and Chief Financial Officer. I very much appreciate the opportunity to speak with you about the impact of COVID-19 on the City University of New York. I will focus my testimony on the financial impact on our campuses and on our students. With New York City being at the epicenter of the coronavirus outbreak in the United States, CUNY's campuses were among the first in the nation to be challenged by COVID-19. Early in the spring 2020 semester, as students and staff began to be individually impacted by the virus, several campuses invested resources to deep clean and disinfect potentially affected facilities. Once the decision was made that the remainder of the semester would be conducted in a remote modality, the university and its colleges quickly pivoted to allocating funds that would ensure that our students would have as much of a seamless transition as possible to distance learning. In addition to the time investment by CUNY's dedicated faculty to moving their syllabi, learning materials, and exams to electronic modes, our campuses also incurred expenses to purchase the technological equipment needed by students and faculty and staff to move to a remote environment. The CUNY Board of Trustees also approved the waiver of a portion of student activity fees for the remainder of the spring 2020 semester and authorized refunds and credits to those students who had to be displaced from their dormitory residences. Since the majority of CUNY students come from backgrounds of limited financial needs, it became immediately obvious to, that many of our students would not be able to successfully complete the spring semester without having a dedicated device for which they can use for their academic work. The university therefore utilized $15 million from its capital budget to purchase over 33,000 devices comprised of both laptops and iPads. We are very appreciative of our funding partners at both the state and city levels who assisted in ensuring that these purchases could be made as quickly as possible. The, de excuse me, the devices were delivered to students both through pickup at their local campuses as well as shipment to their homes. Although the instructional activities moved to a virtual environment, our campuses have remained open and we are extremely thankful to our essential workers, mainly those who are employed in public safety and those who maintain our facilities. Our colleges have invested current year resources to purchase personal protective equipment, such as masks and gloves, and other supplies like hand sanitizer and disinfecting wipes to ensure the safety of these campus workers. The university has also completed bulk purchases of these items to deliver to campuses in need and to begin to create a stockpile that will be available once our campuses are back to a more traditional learning mode. While the issuance of laptops and iPads were extremely helpful, we realized that the financial impact of the coronavirus deeply affected a vast majority of our students and their families. Nearly half of CUNY's 275,000 degree-seeking students work while in school, and many found their jobs and incomes eliminated, drastically reduced, or otherwise imperiled. In addition, many students unfortunately had to deal with themselves or family members contracting the virus. To help with this financial and emotional hardship, Chancellor Felix Matos Rodriguez announced the creation of the Chancellor's Emergency Relief Fund. The fund provides one-time $500 grants to qualifying CUNY students. In April, students receive grants based on the highest financial need, proximity to graduation, and being a student parent. The May distribution focused primarily on, on, on undocumented students and others who are not eligible for federal CARES Act funds. To date, 4,000 students have received grants totaling $2 million. The fund has been supported by the Carolyn Milton Petrie Foundation, the James and Judith K. Diamond Foundation, the Robin Hood Foundation, and the Jeffrey and Shari Aronson Family Foundation, as well as several other corporate philanthropic and individual donors. We are very grateful to our philanthropic partners and are proud of our ability to get these funds into the hands of our students so quickly. CUNY students have also benefited from the Federal CARES Act. This federal stimulus legislation known as the Coronavirus Aid, Relief and Economic Security Act provides emergency grants from the US Department of Education to eligible students to help cover education related expenses caused by the COVID-19 pandemic. The CARES Act directs recipients to use these funds they receive for unexpected expenses, unmet financial need, or expenses related to the disruption of campus operations resulting from the coronavirus. These include expenses for food, housing, course materials, technology, healthcare, or childcare. 
In order to be eligible, students must meet basic eligibility for federal Title IV financial aid. These eligibility criteria include having a demonstrated financial need certified by the family income information provided on the student's free application for federal student, financial, uh, student aid, the FAFSA, being a U.S. citizen or national, permanent resident or, uh, or eligible non-citizen, and being enrolled in a degree or certificate program and making satisfactory academic progress. CUNY's at total allocation from the program is $118 million. About 190,000 undergraduate and graduate students are potentially eligible to receive grants. We are very pleased to report this morning that about $107 million of the total allocation has already been dispersed to students. The average award is over $600, with some students receiving well over $900. Our allocation formula, as Executive Vice Chancellor Cruz mentioned earlier, considers students' financial need and whether or not they have dependents to care for. The second half of the CARES Act funding, which also totals $118 million, is the institutional aid that will be allocated to the campuses to help cover any costs associated with significant changes to the delivery of instruction due to the coronavirus. These funds can be used to expand remote learning programs, build IT capacity to support such programs, and train faculty and staff to operate effectively in a remote learning environment. In addition, these funds can be used to provide more financial grants to students. CUNY's campuses have also received $14 million from the Minority Serving Institution component of the CARES Act. We have developed a plan for the use of the total $132 million that is available and hope to have approval to allocate these funds to the campuses as quickly as possible. While we are grateful for this allocation, we are also preparing for an extremely challenging fiscal environment in the upcoming academic year. While we are pleased that our summer session enrollment numbers are very strong, it is still unknown what the impact of the coronavirus will have on our students and thus on enrollment for the fall 2020 semester. Our funding partners at the state and city are also facing severe funding shortfalls for fiscal year 21, which will have a direct negative impact on CUNY's operating budget. The city's executive plan included 31.6 million in reductions for CUNY, as well as, as, well as proposed cuts to the award-winning ASAP program and the state has projected a $13.3 billion deficit in fiscal year 2021. The university is taking steps to meet this challenge, one of which was to implement a freeze on all personnel actions, including hires and discretionary salary increases. For state and city regulations, the university paused all active campus construction projects with the exception of those that are COVID-19 related or clear health and safety issues. We also directed colleges to refrain from any new one-time or recurring expenditures, with the exception of those that are related to COVID-19 or distance learning instruction and mandated that they not be entering into any new long-term contractual obligations. We're planning on presenting a budget plan for fiscal year 2021 to the Board of Trustees shortly, and that plan will take all of the above into consideration as we craft a budget that will protect our core values as much as possible. Chairperson Barron, all of us at the university very much appreciate your leadership and this committee's strong and continuing advocacy for our students. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. We'll now turn the floor over to Councilwoman Barron for questions. Uh, thank you so much to the panel for their uh, testimony and for bringing us up to date on what it is that CUNY is doing. I do have lots and lots and lots of questions, but before I start my questions, I do want to acknowledge my, that also we are joined by Majority Leader Lori Combo. And as others join, I will announce them as well. So we've heard the testimony and we understand that from your testimony, your projection is that there will be an increase in the student population for the summer semester. And you're not yet firm with the number of students that we can expect to be enrolled in the fall, but at this point, it may be a reduction of 4%. My question is, as we understand that students, as you've indicated, uh, will have lost jobs or have suffered a reduction in their employment hours, how is it that CUNY can continue to stand and say that they support a tuition increase and a new fees added to that tuition increase. How do we justify that? 
how do we justify uh, going along with eliminating ASAP, which is an award-winning program, which is nationally acclaimed, which is replicated in many places across the states? How do we do that in terms of increasing that financial burden on students who are lost their jobs, who may have in fact themselves be, been impacted personally by the virus, who are in a state of hunger, which they like to put the nice late, tidy, tidy label of uh, food insecurity. How can we continue to justify that? How can we not say that we will hold, you know, my position is to go back to free tuition. My position is that education should not end at the 12th grade, just as it used to end at eighth grade, but based on the certain mm -hmm. conditions of society, they moved it to 12th. I think that compulsory education needs to be extended to at least two years post-secondary education paid for by the city and state. So how can we now add this additional financial burden in the era of COVID on students who are already saddled and burdened with these expenses that we have? Thank you, Chair Barron. And just really quickly before I get to tuition, I just want to mention ASAP, and I appreciate you bringing that up. The twenty million dollar proposed reduction in the in the mayor's executive plan. Um, we are um, working with the administration um, to try to to find alternatives to that because we know ASAP is such a successful program, and we want to try to um, uh, avoid having any reductions uh, in, to the level of twenty million dollars that was in our executive plan. So. I appreciate you raising that and for and for recognizing uh, that program um, on tuition. Um, that'll be part. It, it's it's under consideration as part of our overall budget planning, um, as I mentioned in my testimony. Um, and it was part of our budget request for fiscal year 21, a two hundred dollar increase for senior colleges and community colleges. Um, and it's going to be under the consideration, uh, depending on the impact of what our overall budget condition is, and that includes what our public funding is, what our enrollment levels look like, um, the impact on, on campus operations of some of the other revenues that they generate from Bureau Auxiliaries uh, operations and their fundraising. So all those things will get, be taken in into consideration. We very much, uh, uh, take tuition increases very seriously. We are very grateful that um, here in New York, we do have um, the TAP program. Um, we have Excelsior scholarships, federal Pell grants are very helpful for our students. Two thirds of our undergraduate students attend tuition free because of those financial um, aid programs that are in place. And again, we're very grateful that we were able to distribute um, over 107 million of 118 million CARES allocation um, very quickly and get them into the hands of our students. Um, so tuition is something that's under consideration and will be analyzed and a recommendation we made to our board of trustees based on our overall budget condition once more information is known about that. The $107 million uh, you say has already been distributed. Can you that's correct. A, a brief summary of how that money, where that money went? We can provide that. Yes, we can provide that. Um, one of the things about, um, that um, really worked to our advantage on this is um, the financial aid payment process at CUNY um, was centralized several years ago. Um, and so when students get financial aid, um, it's, it's done through the CUNY central office in, in coordination with the campuses, obviously. Um, but by having that centralized mechanism in place, um, that really benefited us in terms of generating the, the checks and the direct deposits to students quickly. Um, but Chair Baron, we could certainly give you information on um, and give you data on where the money has gone so far and give you and give you more specifics about the remaining 11 million and the whole 118 million by campus and, and uh, whatever level of additional detail you would like. Okay, prior to the COVID-19 and the CARES Act, CUNY had an emergency aid funding uh, available to students. And if students have received such emergency aid funds from CUNY in previous semesters, are they still able 
to apply for and receive emergency funds now? And what are the categories that are considered emergency aid by CUNY? Yeah, the Chancellor's Emergency Fund um, is available. And, and again, we're very pleased that um, fourth, uh, we've been able to give out um, $2 million to, to 4,000 students. We're really pleased about that. Um, we're very grateful to our philanthropic partners for, for seeding that program and for all the people, I'm sure there's a lot of people at this hearing today that have, have made contributions as well. So we're really grateful for that. Um, and that's a really um, important source of funding because the CARES Act, is, as um, grateful as we are to receive it, um, and we're again grateful to our um, our leaders in, in Congress and the Senate that helped pass that, it is limited. Um, I think that's something that everyone should be aware of. It is limited um, to students who are eligible for Title IV and who are, um, who are residents uh, of the United States. And so we had a, a bunch of our DACA students or undocumented students um, who were not eligible for that. And in addition, there, there could be some students and, and likely are many who, um, just barely miss out on Title IV eligibility, but their families may have lost their jobs or they may have lost their jobs as a result of the coronavirus. And they did have um, financial limitations as a result. Um, and so um, we're really targeting those emergency funds to those students who have those needs and who won't be eligible to receive uh, funding through the CARES Act. So uh, of the 118 million that is designated for institutional expenses, including ro lost revenues and payroll for employees. What is the breakdown of the distribution of that money by CUNY institutions, by each institution? And how did you determine what each institution? Is it proportional to enrollment? How is, what is the formula that you use? And can you give me the breakdown for each campus? Yeah, no, that's that's a that's a terrific question, and it was actually determined by the federal government. Um, the federal government had a formula that actually benefited CUNY because it was based on Pell eligibility, and so every single institution in the United States um, received a discrete allocation of those funds, and it was based on um, seventy-five percent Pell eligible students and twenty-five percent non-Pell eligible students, and so. Because we have such a large proportion of Pell eligible students, um, CUNY's total allocation of 118 million was proportionally higher than most other institutions. And um, we do have the breakout by campus. Um, the the, the uh, federal formula had a specific amount for every single campus and we're, we're happy to provide you and the, and the committee members with those amounts. And can that money, how much of that money will be dedicated for adjunct faculty? Because we understand that that is a category of, uh, of employees who are very, well, they've gotten an increase, but not in fact what they really are a reflection of the work that they do. But can campuses use that? Or is there a formula that the central administration is saying should be used or is it up to each campus now to decide how they will apply the funds that they have received? A proportion or a percentage for uh, payroll? Well, um, there are very um, specific uses that the funds can be used for uh, that were outlined by the U.S. Department of Education. It was for to expand remote learning programs, um, to build IT capacity to support such programs, to train faculty and staff, um, to um, offset costs of the, the coronavirus, and to expand support for, for students' financial needs. So in addition to the grants that the students have, some of the institutional money can be used to, for additional um, student needs. Um, but so, in terms of employee salary, what, what can we expect might be covered through that? The only component that could be covered that's employee salaries are the uh, for costs that are incurred for additional training or professional development um, for um, for going towards distance education. It, it, um, and that's something that you know, we've been pointing out to our campuses and to, and to um, folks externally to the universities that it does have specific uses related to the coronavirus. It cannot be used just for 
gap closing activities or to cover a budget shortfall. Um, it, there are specific um, uses that are outlined um, by the US Department of Education. So CUNY's website indicates that the federal government determined the total allocation for each constituent uh, CUNY college. And as a result, the base amount of a student's grant will vary depending on which college they attend. So if there are students with similar kinds of needs at different institutions, how can we uh, understand the variation in the amount that they will get? Yeah, the, I, I'm gonna, and I'm gonna ask my, my colleague, instead of Vice Chancellor Cruz to talk some more about that because he and his team did an outstanding job in, in creating a pro progressive formula um, to, to allocate those funds to the students. And so the federal um, Department of Ed, um, as I mentioned earlier, came up with the formula, 75% Pell, 25% non-Pell, right. to give an amount to each campus. The CUNY then determined the allocation formula to fit within that amount of money for each campus as to how much each student um, would receive. So I'm gonna ask um, Executive Vice Chancellor Cruz to describe that a little, a little further. Sure, thank you, Matt, and thank you, uh, Chairwoman. Uh, so basically what we went about was trying to develop an equitable allocation model for each one of our campuses. And so the model is the same for all of our campuses. Uh, the model basically ensures that all of our Title IV eligible students, students that um, are eligible to receive from, from the CARES Act, get a base amount. So everyone that is eligible will get a base amount. And then on top of that base amount, we devised an allocation formula that would consider providing students additional funding based on their level of need as determined by their um, uh, financial um, applications, uh, financial aid applications. And so um, a, a, a student whose expected family contribution to their studies was between zero and 25%, say, would get a 25% um, increase over their base amount um, okay. all the way up depending on how much the expected family contribution was. And then on top of that, if they also had dependents, they would get an extra 25%. So um, on any given campus, you will have students that are receiving either from the base amount all the way up to 150% of that base amount. And then in order to be able to implement that within the guidance that we were provided by the federal government, the base amount had to be adjusted by campus based on how much money they actually received. So the, the formula is the same for everyone. The amounts vary, but they vary because of the way they were allocated by the federal government. Thank you. Uh, just general questions, and I'll come back to the finances a little later. Prior to COVID-19, did CUNY have a general emergency preparedness plan or process in place? And if not, why not? Did we not think that far? I mean, we're the great CUNY institution, and I mean that very sincerely. Did we have a body of people who were thinking in a, in a, think, a think environment about, well, what if this were to happen? Did anyone ever share with CUNY, you know, well, there might be a pandemic. Did we have that kind of broad view? Uh, Chair Barron, we do have um, a, a system-wide emergency plan um, for emergencies, whether it's a, a weather emergency or, or um, you know, the emergency that we're dealing with now. So there is a, a formal written plan. And not only does the university have a plan at the university level, but each campus has emergency plans. Um, we also have a, a CUNY Risk Management and Business Continuity Council made up again from folks at the central office and the colleges that meet every single month to prepare for such emergencies. Um, and uh, the other thing I'll mention is we work very closely with our partners in city government in the Office of Emergency Management. Um, we do have a desk at, at the OEM Emergency Operations Center, state level as well, state um, emergency management office, SEMO. And um, we have worked closely with FEMA in the past and have already begun um, talking with FEMA about, um, about this emergency as well. So, so yes, we do have plans um, and uh, at the university level and each of our colleges have plans as well. So, um, so individual campuses have separate emergency preparedness plans 
are they subject to what it is from the central plan? How are they coordinated? Uh, do individual campuses have a coordination with other nearby campuses or things of that nature where they would rely on one another? Uh, yes, and, and you know, that's one of the, you know, someone who has now been here at CUNY um, for a while and, and uh, has been here through this pandemic and was there for Hurricane Sandy. Um, one of the things that so, you know, one of the many things that's so great about our institution is um, the way the campuses work together to help each other out. Um, and some campuses are more severely affected by than others. But, but yes, the plans are coordinated and the plans may have to be different for different type of campuses. Our Manhattan vertical campuses are gonna have a different type of emergency plan than maybe Queens College or the College of Staten Island, which is a more you know, traditional type of campus with, with uh, you know, lots of acreage to cover. Um, so yes, the plans are, do differ, but they are coordinated um, together. And with who within the CUNY chain of command uh, has duties under this plan? Who are the people that are the primary points of contact or decision makers? And we would like to get a copy of the plan, if you could share that with us, with the committee. Sure, we'll, we'll get that to you. Um, and it's, it's the risk managers at, at each of our campuses. Um, we have a director of environmental health um, and safety um, at the university level who coordinates this. Um, he reports to the chief operating officer. But yes, please to, uh, to, to gather those plans and, and make sure that the committee receives And do, do the plans call for any type of practice drills on a regular basis or a scheduled basis? Uh, Chair Brown, I believe that they do, but I, I am not 100% certain and I don't want to give you incorrect information. So um, we'll go back and check. Um, I believe that the answer is yes, but I'm not 100% sure. Um, so we'll go back and check and, and make sure we get you the, the correct response on that one. Okay, and how often is each plan updated? Um, that I'm not certain about either, but we'll, we'll, we'll find out and, and, and get you that answer. And I would be interested to know if the plans provide for uh, service contingencies, uh, like access to the academic, the housing, because we're now here in the throes of what we are experiencing. And we just want to make sure that uh, all of those kinds of areas are, are covered. Understood. Thank you. The Chancellor's Emergency Relief Grant Program uh, which was created and includes benefit to undocumented students, DACA students, and some international students who are ineligible for the Emergency Cares Act, uh, was funded through philanthropic donors, and we thank them for that. And you say that there are 2,000 students in April and another 2,000 that received funds from this program in May? Correct. 4,000 students so far. Uh, uh, Chair Barron, I'm not sure if the breakout was was 2,000 per month, but in total, yes, it was 4,000 students um, that have received grants so far. And, and it, uh, the total that we've given out to date is about $2 million. $2 million. okay. And are there plans to continue uh, or have further disbursements from this emergency aid? Absolutely, we're hoping that more funds come in. Um, and, uh, you know, the website is, is available for folks to go to um, if they want to donate, obviously, the, the large gifts that we've gotten from the philanthropic partners that you mentioned have been great to seed um, the, the emergency fund, but um, any contribution that folks can make is greatly appreciated. And like I said, I know there's probably folks on, that are attending this hearing that have made contributions. So yeah, as, as additional funds come in, the intent is to continue to give the money out as quickly as possible. Have students expressed any type of concerns about uh, sharing their private information in this category of undocumented students and doctors? Have they expressed any kind of reservation or concerns about sharing that information of their status? Not that I'm aware of. I mean, obviously that is a you know, sensitive issue and, and you know, CUNY protects uh, the privacy of, of all of our students, but especially that group of students um, you know, incredibly well, but um, I am not aware of, of any concerns that have been raised regarding that. Um, in the student panel that was prior to the, your panel talking, uh, they talked about academic interruption to their, uh, to their progress at CUNY. Do we have any way of tracking the academic 
outcomes of students who are the recipient of this aid? And do we know whether or not uh, there's a way to find out why students have had these major, is it something, uh, a particular category or cause for them to have uh, perhaps a breakaway year or a gap year? Do we have any way of tracking that kind of success? Um, sure. Chairwoman, uh, we are in the process of um, analyzing the data for this past semester that just completed. Um, the final day for grade submissions was May 28th. Um, and I'm happy to say that when we're looking, and it's a preliminary uh, analysis that we have so far, when we're looking at the percentage of our students that uh, were not able to progress in specific courses, um, we're seeing that those percentages are on par with previous years. Uh, we believe that one of the reasons for this is not only the great work that our faculty did to try to engage our students through this time, but also some policy decisions that we made around postponing the dates through which, um, by which students could withdraw from a course, and also the creation of a flexible credit, no credit grading policy that will allow our students to convert their grades to credit, no credit, um, 20 days after having a chance to look at what they received in a particular course and talking to their advisors. Um, so, so far, um, uh, academic momentum with the data we do have seems to be on par with previous years, um, but we need to do a little bit more digging and see how the credit, no credit policy plays out before we can give you more um, final information. Uh, that's going to be very interesting to see uh, if students opt for that, and if they feel that perhaps it might have some stigma or negative impact as they move forward and perhaps apply to uh, other schools, although we know it's being experienced around the nation. So we, we would like to know what you're doing to help students persist and stay on track to degree completion. Uh, but history shows that in the times of economic downturns and periods of high unemployment, there tends to be an increase in enrollment at community colleges. So what is CUNY doing or planning to do to support students entering community colleges during this time of a pandemic and uncertainty? What is CUNY doing for this incoming or the present population at community colleges in particular? Well, we're in the process right now of um, uh, redoubling uh, or doubling down on our uh, recruitment and advising efforts um, through the remote modalities that we have available to us at this point in time. Uh, to ensure that our students, um, continuing students that are aspiring to transfer uh, from community colleges to senior colleges have all the information they have uh, in order to do that. Uh, and we're also happy to say that just from a, um, a freshman perspective, right, our, our new entering students, um, we're seeing a slight uptick with respect to last year um, at, our, at most of our community colleges from the DOE. Uh, so uh, we're, we're doing the best we can to ensure that uh, that expansion of opportunity that we're known for continues even against these uh, most dramatic backdrops. I have lots more questions, but I am going to take a pause here and going to ask council if they would give an opportunity for other members who might have questions to pose their questions at this time, and then I'll come back. Thank you, Chair Barron. This is Malcolm Buterhorn. I'm co-counsel with Paul Senegal for today's higher education hearing. If any council members present have any questions for the CUNY administration, please use the Zoom raised hand function now and we will call you in the order that you raise your hand. Okay, Chair Barron, at this time, it appears your colleagues do not have any questions, so I turn it back to you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you for stepping up, Malcolm. Glad you're here. We always have to have a backup plan and you're doing great, thank you. So back to the panel then. Um, can you give me specific examples of how CUNY is supporting students who applied for emergency aid, but perhaps did not receive it and how they might be connected to other services and supports that can address some of their basic needs, such as food stop, uh, food pantry, single stop, other campus and community-based supports. Can you share with us what you're doing to make sure that students don't fall through the gap? So in addition to the examples that uh, 
my colleague Matt Sapienza has provided uh, of things that we're doing at the system level, we have to remember that our campus systems also have a long tradition of uh, providing support to our students in these areas. And they have continued to do so uh, even through the pandemic. Um, they all have, um, or most have, um, been able to secure funding for emergency grants. Um, they have uh, been able to create one-stop uh, solutions for students that may, may be in need of, uh, of brokering relationships with the city for services that they're entitled to. And that work um, has certainly continued. Um, and so uh, a lot of what we have done at the central level to ensure that students who may in the past not have known about these uh, uh, opportunities because may, they may not have needed them um, is a, the creation of a very comprehensive uh, portal, um, our COVID-19 portal on our cuny.edu website, uh, which not only provides high level overview of all of these opportunities, but allows us to, to drill down to their specific campus and see what they can uh, 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 expect from their campus in terms of food pantries, emergency aid, uh, counseling, and so forth. Um, so um, while there is some variation uh, campus to campus, uh, most of the services that uh, the chairwoman has mentioned um, um, are available and the information is provided through that portal. Um, and if I may, because you had made a, a question earlier and I, and I failed to um, uh, state the obvious um, around the community colleges, um, yes. as, as we work hard to ensure that uh, we can um, expand access as much as we can uh, in that area, um, the ASAP question that you had raised earlier is crucial because as you yeah. know, that's not only something that, that has great outcomes at the end, but it's also yeah. a very attractive uh, recruiting tool. That's right. Uh, talking about food insecurity, when CUNY's physical campuses closed in March, it was at first indicated that the on-campus food programs would remain open, but as the uh, pandemic persisted, pantries began to close and others had more restrictive access, including limited hours or required to have an appointment. How often do CUNY communicate the availability of food campus pantries to students? Who's responsible for that information? How is it done? And can a student from a school without a pantry access pantry at another campus? Yes, thank you for that question. So we have update um, information. Uh, we try to make it as real time as possible on the coronavirus um, student continuity website I mentioned a minute ago. So a student could go into the food pantry section and see um, campus by campus what the hours of operations are, um, if appointments are needed and whatnot. There's variation um, as you would expect across our, our food pantries in the system. Um, some of them have explicitly uh, indicated and we're working through a committee to uh, have a more uniform policy statement on this front um, that, the, that any student, CUNY student uh, would be welcome to use the services and others um, do so when confronted with a student from another school. Uh, so we're clearly working to try to create a more uniform um, a statement on, on how those services are delivered, uh, what the times are, right, the appointment uh, structures. Um, um, so we have a committee on that. But for now, um, any student that's interested uh, can simply go to the COVID-19 webpage and, and get some information on their own uh, food pantry. Oh, so the May 2020 Education, New York, uh, Education Trust New York uh, found that 56% of New York State's low-income college students skipped meals because they couldn't afford them or couldn't access food. So how is CUNY making sure that the existing food pantries will be stocked and staffed by fall 2020 and are additional funds needed to ensure that these pantries stay open in the fall? And if so, uh, what, how much is needed for the food, for the storage, for the cleaning, for the disinfecting? So food insecurity, as, as, as Madam Chair knows, um, was a, an important issue for CUNY before COVID-19. It certainly yes. is through and will continue to be moving forward. Um, so to the question of additional funding, uh, yes, um, it, it can only help. Um, to the extent of 
uh, what we have been doing. Um, we have, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, been working to ensure that the services continue um, and that uh, we use the funding that has been made available through us, either through the CARES Act or through the Chancellor's Initiative on creating an emergency fund, that those funds are quickly dispersed uh, to our most vulnerable students. Um, this is uh, clearly uh, uh, one of those uh, wicked problems um, that, uh, uh, that institutions such as CUNY uh, have to deal with, and we're ready to continue to work on that front. Um, but I just wanna make sure that, that the, of making the point that we acknowledge it, that we embrace the need to do more, and that we're looking for partnership and investments to make sure that we do the best we can for our students. In, in that regard, what is the amount, what are the, what's the dollar amount attached to the food pantries in CUNY? How can we, what's that dollar amount? I would, I would have to come back uh, to the committee with that number. Um, the way that the food pantries have evolved in each one of our campuses has been different. Mm -hmm. um, in my prior life, about nine months ago, I uh, used to be the president of Lehman College, and I remember very well how our food pantry at Lehman um, came to be, and it came to be through a student-led um, effort um, and uh, fundraising, um, and, and then eventually um, was be benefited from investments like, for example, those that uh, the New York City Council and others have made. Uh, so we would uh, need to come back to you with... Uh, a more direct um, answer as to how each one of them are funded and what their needs may be. And are there any kind of uh, basic standards or goals that would include uh, the assurance that there's fresh, healthy foods, fruits, and some vegetables that might be included in these pantries so it's not a high percentage of processed or canned foods? Yeah, that's part of what um, I know many of our colleges are doing on their own as they're looking at uh, their own pantries. And part of what we have asked this uh, system level committee I mentioned earlier, that's trying to look at a more uniform approach to food pantries is looking into. Okay, in the May 2020 report uh, prepared by Healthy CUNY, the CUNY Urban Food Policy Institute and the Hope Center, it recommended creating a director of food security role at CUNY Central to coordinate and monitor food efforts across CUNY. The same report also recommends creating a quote, university-wide task force for promoting food security, charged with developing, implementing, and monitoring a plan to significantly reduce food insecurity at CUNY within three years. What's your response to this report? Are you considering a director uh, and what is, what about the university-wide task force that this report recommends? Well, the committee I mentioned a minute ago is, is the, the beginnings, if you will, of what a task force could look like. Um, and so I would expect it to function in that, in that way. Um, again, even before pre-COVID-19, uh, the university has always viewed uh, the development of its uh, budget requests as an articulation of values. And the chairwoman may remember that one of the three buckets of uh, funding that the university was advocating for was precisely on student health and wellness with food insecurity being uh, one of the important factors there. Um, so uh, the short answer is yes, um, we uh, are in, in the process of uh, putting together um, what the equivalent of a task force based on that trust recommendations would look like as in, in terms of a uh, a designated or dedicated person uh, to look at that issue. We do have um, a small team within uh, Student Affairs that uh, dedicates significant time and effort to these issues. And so that's a thing that we would be uh, wanting to think a little bit more about moving forward. So uh, I heard you say, I think I remember you saying that uh, you're trying to make sure that students not be restricted to their home campus for assistance, where are we? Is that already in place or what is the timeline for that happen? Particularly now that single stop uh, campus offices are closed and are there instead offering virtual services. So where are we along that goal of making sure that any CUNY student can go to any CUNY, CUNY uh, facility and get service. Right. So, so the committee I mentioned um, is uh, working with the individual campuses 
uh, to see what impediments, if any, there would be to just making that a blanket assertion. Uh, we, we, have have, se we have several that are already doing it. Do we have a target date to make sure that that's fully implemented, that students yes. not be Yes, so we, we, have, uh, we have a very aggressive uh, target date of finishing this work by the end of this uh, month, by June, so that we can start the fiscal year with, um, uh, with a better communication strategy on this front. Um, okay. But just wanted to make sure that, um, and if somebody on this panel or elsewhere hears differently, uh, that, uh, that you please let us know if anybody's actually been turned away from one of our pantries. Because one of the things is to explicitly say that it's open for everybody. Another one is to turn people away. And, and I'm not aware that that has happened. Okay. What is CUNY's long-term plan regarding single staff? So we, we are interested in ensuring that the uh, single stop services um, are continued and strengthened um, throughout our, our campuses. Um, and, and that's part of a, a group that we had working on pre-COVID-19, um, understanding that um, our single stop agreement would end uh, with the fiscal year. Um, the services will not change overnight. Um, and uh, what we do hope is to strengthen them. Um, the only thing that's changing is the branding um, of, of the services at this point. Uh, would CUNY support the call to supply hot food to students who are SNAP recipients? Would CUNY support that, that, that move to include um, hot food in, for, in SNAP, for SNAP recipients? The ability to use SNAP benefits for hot foods? Yes. Yes. As somebody yeah. that, that was hungry for many of my years? Yes. Mm -hmm. Um, and what's the future of cafeteria services at CUNY? I, I, there may be a plan I've heard for one vendor for all of CUNY. Is that still the approach? And what yes. do we benefit that? How will that operate? And if CUNY has to have remote learning continuing in the fall, how will that impact it? And what's the timeline? Mm -hmm. for I, will turn, I will turn it over to my colleague, Matt Sapienza. Okay. Thank you. Um, yeah, no, thanks, Chair Baron. I appreciate you, you, you raising this issue. And it's very timely because last night we had a board um, fiscal committee meeting um, in which the committee approved a um, contract with a university wide vendor to provide food service. Um, and just to give a very quick background, historically at CUNY, each of the colleges entered into their own contract to have food services at that campus. And so the services that were provided were, were very disparate amongst the campuses. Um, some it was done very well, some not so well. The pricing was very different at different campuses. Um, and so uh, the decision was made to go ahead and to um, do a public procurement and um, enter into a contract with one vendor. Um, and so we received approval last night from the board fiscal committee. It'll now go to the full board at their next meeting on June 29th. Um, the vendor that we selected um, is a firm called Culinart, very big national firm who um, has a lot of higher ed clients here in New York state and, and elsewhere throughout the country. Um, and one of the things that um, we're so excited about is um, as part of this agreement, Colin Art is going to invest $16 million in capital upgrades in our cafeterias. Um, so some of our cafeterias that um, were constructed in the 1960s and 1970s and, and still look that way, unfortunately, um, are going to get a refresh. Um, and that's going to make a much more pleasant situation for our students to congregate and to eat and to um, have a place that they can go to on campus. Um, and then one of the other things, and, and you, you uh, have you know, talked about it a lot at, on, at this hearing, which we appreciate, which is food insecurity. Um, as part of this agreement, Cullinart um, has agreed, and, and the contract's not finalized yet because we're waiting for board approval, but um, Cullinart has agreed that they will um, contribute $2 million to food insecurity um, as part of this contract. 
Um, and so what that will look like essentially is we will take funding each year and um, from the vendor and we will um, use those funds to add to students. Um, we'll have a swipe card that they can use um, in the cafeteria and you know, we'll work with our campuses to determine what students will be eligible and how much students will receive. Um, but we, we're really excited about it too. And that was something that our, our chancellor and chief operating officer were very focused on as part of this agreement um, would be having um, uh, a component that would be dedicated to food insecurity. So we're, we're really excited about it. And it was um, a really collaborative effort and I wanna thank our students too, who gave us some tremendous feedback as we went through this process. So as you're talking about this uh, vendor making um, a commitment to do upgrades at the cafeteria, we know that CUNY's infrastructure has long been in a state of decay and disrepair. And so now that facilities uh, are likely to have been underutilized during the pandemic, are there any concerns about making them safe and getting them ready for code by the time students return to campuses? And in that regard, to what extent has CUNY engaged in disinfecting classrooms and labs and common areas? And uh, since they will not use facilities, has there been an offset in the costs that can ensure that the safety of those cleaning these facilities will be uh, included or considered? Yeah, no, th those are very good. Those are very good questions. You know, in terms of the cost, it's interesting in the current fiscal year that we're in fiscal 20, which is ending in three weeks, um, our campuses did incur additional expenses. And very early on um, in March, as students or faculty um, were contracting the virus, um, campuses were shutting down and or shutting down facilities that those folks might have, have um, uh, visited. And we were doing deep cleaning and, and sanitizing and bringing in outside firms to do that. Once we went to remote learning though, um, those costs, um, you know, kind of stopped for the most part. And as, as you mentioned, Chair Barron, we've had savings because we have been in remote modality. Some of our purchasing budget has certainly um, been reduced. Um, we've had energy savings and energy costs. We've had savings and travel costs. Um, and so those savings have in the current year have kind of offset the additional expenses that we have uh, did incur in the current year, which has been helpful. Um, but going forward, yes, we do have a coronavirus task force that is, is um, working on those issues and analyzing what the needs are in terms of the facilities um, when we do reopen, what um, social distancing might look like, um, what kind of equipment might be needed, whether it's plexiglass for offices that students uh, visit sure. a lot, what kind of personal protective equipment we need. As I mentioned in my testimony, we are um, through our uh, procurement office. Um, trying to uh, purchase as many PPEs as possible so that we have a stockpile when uh, we do uh, reopen for more traditional learning. So we are working on all those things, very much uh, you know, part of what we talk about every day. And, and the coronavirus task force is, is um, working with our campuses um, because campuses, again, vertical campuses versus mm -hmm. um, you know, campuses in, in um, you know, in more traditional modes are gonna have different needs. Uh, as we talk about this crisis and the impact and, and the expectation that we're gonna have an increase in the wave of homelessness, how is CUNY making plans or provisions or trying to analyze what they can do to assist those students who may face eviction and may in fact not, because we're talking about people not being evicted now during these three or four months. But at the end of that time, unless the state and the Fed step up and forgive that, that uh, those past due amounts, they're gonna be saddled with, pay, pay, uh, pacing, with facing to pay four months rent. And then perhaps evictions will begin to, to uh, be prominent. So, is CUNY considering that? Is CUNY thinking about perhaps finding other locations that they might also use to house students who become homeless? What is CUNY doing in that regard? And are you continuing your, pro your program for those students in foster care 
what's the impact on that? Because that's another population of students with housing needs. Yeah, the foster care program, um, those students are, are uh, continuing to be housed. Um, all, all of our students who were in dorm residents um, that um, you know, left after the coronavirus, we did um, work with our campuses to determine what students um, didn't have a place to go to, um, essentially. And so um, we moved all of those students into one uh, dorm, which is at Queens College. Uh, we, the, the, uh, the dorm there is, is called the Summit. Um, and I believe we have about 250 students there currently um, because we know that there were some students who um, were living in our facilities that did not have a, a place to go to, or if they did, they couldn't get there um, because of the travel restrictions. And so um, we are housing uh, about 250 students at Queens College currently. So are there any plans to look to be able to expand the total number of students that, are, that use CUNY housing understanding that there may be students who are going to be evicted, they and their families are going to be evicted, and what possibly can we do to provide housing? Yeah, those are things that our coronavirus task force are looking at. Um, you know, the CARES Act, the institutional funds of the CARES Act does provide um, the ability to give emergency grant, additional emergency grants to students, and one of the uh, uses of that is for housing. Um, and so that's a possibility um, that, that can be used to help students. And so um, we are looking at those things. Um, it's challenging because uh, of most of our dorm facilities um, are set up for um, multi student, you know, many few students in, in one room, but as, as most uh, dorm facilities are throughout the country at, uh, at, at colleges and universities. Um, right now at Queens, because we only we only have 250 students, and I believe that facility um, um, can uh, uh, accommodate, I think, 550 or 600 students. We are able to keep one into a room, um, but going forward, that's something, especially in the short term, that we have to also consider as well: is how do we um, keep the students safe um, that are going to be in our residences? So again, that's something that our coronavirus task force is, is analyzing well, and, and trying, to, uh, trying to come up with solutions for. How many students did CUNY have that were in its uh, dorms before uh, We this? had, yeah, we had, I believe it was about 3,300 students, a little over 3,000, 3,300 students that were in uh, dorm facilities prior to, uh, prior to the virus. Okay. Um, just a few more questions. We talked about the mental health needs. They, they're always prominent and prevalent and in, in, of importance for our student population as well as the general population. But this crisis is going to wreak havoc with those who perhaps were quite balanced and didn't have any kind of emotional imbalances but now as a result of what they're experiencing are in need of uh, the services of a mental health capacity, a mental health professional. What can CUNY do particularly for its students to address that need? We understand it was a limited number. The ratio was inappropriate for counselors to students. And there are gonna be, I believe, more students now with that need. So what is CUNY, what are CUNY's plans to provide that service? Right. So even pre-COVID-19, we had articulated very detailed plans on how to uh, get to a much better place on uh, health, um, mental health um, mm -hmm. issues for our students. Um, and, and I know Nick Freudenberg may be speaking uh, later in a different panel and, and we'll be able to speak a little more about concrete recommendations of what the university can do. As of this moment, what we're focusing in on is um, a few things. One is how do we make sure that in a fall semester, for example, where we may still expect uh, some um, uh, online instruction and some remote support services to be uh, happening, how do we make sure that our faculty and staff are prepared 
uh, to help our students uh, navigate their mental health issues. And so we have, uh, we're developing, we're currently developing training, um, uh, upskilling uh, training uh, webinars uh, and certificate pro uh, uh, programs for, for our faculty and staff that are interested in serving um, as uh, so facilitators, are, are, if you will. Are you planning to increase uh, or a higher personnel that are trained in that regard to provide that services? Or are you expecting the existing staff to become trained and add to whatever their responsibilities are to now provide these services? Right. Well, we're, we're trying, one, one of the first steps is to try to make sure that all of our faculty and staff are aware of mental health issues and that can manage them uh, in an appropriate way in a classroom setting or a support service uh, interaction and that are uh, trained uh, to um, uh, direct our students in the proper way to the services that may be available to them. So that's one, one bucket. Pre-COVID-19, we were also in conversations with the mayor's office about how to better connect um, our students to the services that the city already provides that they may have access to. And so that's a conversation that we hope to be able to retake in the next few weeks um, uh, as it was abruptly, um, as you would expect, canceled in mid-March um, as we all had to move in different directions. And so that would be another piece of it. And then the third uh, piece of it, of course, is to try to continue to figure out ways to get the right levels of investments so that we yeah. can push forward with the, with the plans that we had set out in our budget request, uh, which were um, our best thinking at the time and um, of what we could do to reduce those uh, counselor to student ratios uh, or student to counselor ratios, I'm sorry, um, uh, and, and, and really uh, figure out how we can accelerate progress on that front. Um, we feel that uh, we may have a chance to do that through the CARES Act funding. Uh, uh -huh. It may be a one-time injection, but it may be what we need to just, you know, get some traction on this issue. Um, and so that's how we're thinking mm -hmm. about it right now at the central office and have several teams um, uh, advancing that work. Have you thought about perhaps also embedding mental health counselors in the childcare centers uh, when the campus is open and provide that service? Because I would imagine that's an added stressor for the student parents that are, that are using our services. Yes, you make a great point. We have not thought about that one specifically, but we, do ha we have thought about how do we make sure that our counselors are, can meet the students where they're at, right? We've also heard, for example, from our own child care uh, providers that usually they are the first ones to, mm -hmm. to identify a mental health issue. Yeah. Right. Um, and so how do we train them to connect them with the rest of our infrastructure so that the students can get the services they need? And is your training uh, in, uh, looking and examining to make sure that it's culturally relevant staffing and programs and sensitivities so that we are reaching out to all of our population? Yeah, that's the CUNY way. Okay. <laughs> A uh, few more questions and then we're almost done. And if, uh, if the other panel is, if there are other council members that have raised their hand, they'll be able to join us as well. So in terms of our needs, we're talking about the ratio of students to um, healthcare providers, mental health care providers. We need to look at the ratio of students to faculty students to instructional staff. What are CUNY's plans to maintain the required adjunct faculty that will be able to provide the instruction and the interaction that's needed to make a, a, a wholesome educational program? We can have remote learning and we can have 500,000 students with one, but that's not achieving what we really want to have in terms of student instructor, student faculty interaction, student to student interaction. What are we doing to make sure that we maintain the educational goal of interacting with students, challenging students, having a dialogue and an instructor, particularly we're talking about the adjuncts, because I'm hearing that they're getting layoff letters or that there's uh, uh, a timetable 
by the end of this month by which they will be getting notices. So what are we doing to protect them? What are we doing to maintain them? What are we doing to make sure that students get that benefit? That's a really good pre uh, question. And I'll, I'll talk on the academic side and perhaps Matt would, would wanna talk on the financial side. You know, I think we're doing a lot of scenario planning. Um, to your point, Chairwoman, um, our mission at the University of New York is to serve as a vehicle of upward mobility for the historically underserved students of this city. Um, and that is a mission that I would say that we meet uh, very well. In fact, I've been at many institutions across the country and, and I have seldom, if ever, seen an institution that, that tracks as closely to meeting its mission as we do, um, routinely being uh, ranked top in the country as a top engine of opportunity for social mobility of our students. And so that's something that uh, when you're faced with dramatic uh, stress and disruption that you need to embrace your mission. And so as we look at uh, what lies ahead uh, and we do our scenario planning, we're trying to make sure that uh, we organize our work and our resources in a way that will allow our students to get the courses they need when they need them with the faculty and the learning conditions that will allow them to succeed and that will allow them to not only advance in their degrees and graduate, but get a family sustaining wage um, and go on to graduate school and do great things. So that but hasn't is, changed. But isn't, that hasn't in fact, changed. isn't in fact CUNY cutting back on its course offerings? Well, the situation is here and that's where the financial piece comes in, right? So how do we do scenario planning uh, to meet those goals and what are the constraints around that? What are the constraints that guide your decision-making and what you can do? And uh, there's a lot of uncertainty, as you well know, as to not only what CUNY's budget will be, but what the city's budget will be and the state's budget will be. And so as we do the scenario planning, we're looking at ways that we can, um, if you will, have our cake and eat it too. And one of the reasons why no letters or very few letters of uh, non-reappointment for adjuncts have gone out is because the university has decided um, in conversations with the PSC that we want to push out that date as far as possible so we have as much good information <laughs> about the budget before we need to make those hard decisions. And so that's how we're approaching it. Um, and, and hopefully we're doing it, I think, in as responsible a way as we can, uh, given the, the, the times we're living. Um, and I don't know, Matt, if you want to say a few more. Yeah, no, no, thank you. And, and um, what I'll add to that is, um, again, we're very grateful to our union partners at the Professional Staff Congress for um, agreeing to, to push be that back that contractual date um, for mm -hmm. notifying adjuncts to give us more time and more certainty, uh, hopefully, on our budget situation. And I uh, also want to, to uh, express gratitude to our union partners for the contract that we settled um, um, back in the fall, um, to, to chair Barron's point, um, one of the, one of the really terrific components of that agreement was a paid office hour for every three credits taught by adjuncts, um, for again, time on task with students and also to compensate for the adjuncts for that work that they're doing. So again, we, we were pleased about that. Um, but as, uh, as, as Jose Luis said, um, the challenge here is what is our budget condition going to be for next year? Um, what is our public funding going to be? What's our enrollment levels going to look like? What are the other um, non-tax levy revenues that we generate? Are they going to be diminished um, because of the coronavirus or because of a different modality that we might be in for the fall? So um, as Executive Vice Chancellor Cruz said, we're doing a, a ton of scenario planning right now. Um, at the university level and with our campuses so that um, no matter what situation um, we find ourselves in with our, our budget situation, um, that we're ready and we're prepared. Um, and so <laughs> those, uh, those analyses are, are taking place and have been for the last several weeks. And, and uh, finally, through all of this that we're talking about, you know, my uh, longstanding concern is the lack of black and brown faculty, professors, uh, vice presidents and presidents in the CUNY system. 
And my concern again is what are we going to do? I know we had a plan, but the plan was not generating the uh, results that we were seeking. So how are we going to make sure that this horrible pandemic that we're facing does not just throw this total plan out of kilter and push it to another back burner and we continue to perpetuate the inequity that exists throughout the system and which is being revealed by this pandemic to those who perhaps had on blinders or sunglasses or just not were aware, how are we going to make sure that we don't undermine that that pledge and that plan to move forward and make sure that as we go forward, black and brown faculty, administrators and management and leadership reflect what it is that our population is in CUNY. Yeah, I, 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 I know that this is a, 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 um, a very important topic that you have uh, really um, raised to the forefront, Chair Barron. I know we've had hearings on this. Um, and as you mentioned, we do have a plan. And I think the answer to the question is how do we ensure it is it's, it's gonna come from the leadership. And I know our chancellor is incredibly devoted to this issue. I know our, our board of trustees are as well. Um, our chancellor has, has made um, some presidential appointments already. I think that, that reflect that. Um, and we have a lot of presidential vacancies currently. I think we have seven searches or something like that going on. So um, I think um, that our chancellor is, is, is uh, incredibly focused on this as is his entire team, um, go, going all the way down to the college presidents in terms of, as you said, faculty appointments. And so um, I think uh, we're very confident that uh, we're gonna make some really good progress on this front going forward. Uh, that concludes my questions. Thank you. And if there are subsequent questions, we will have them sent to you and look forward to your response as we always do have that done. And I'll turn it back to uh, the host, the technician. And if there are questions from council members, they will pre be presented to you as well. Thank you. At this time, Chair Barron, there are your colleagues don't have any questions. Did you have any closing remarks before we move to uh, the first public panel? Just want to again, once again, thank the committee uh, for their work in preparing this. And to the panel, thank you for the work that you do. Uh, you know, CUNY is very dear to my heart because I'm a CUNY alum, having graduated from Hunter College, January 1967, bachelor's in physiology, minor in psychology. And my parents both worked, but did not have that extra cash to have to pay for what would have been tuition had I not been able to go to CUNY tuition free. So it's very dear to my heart. It's a, it's a gateway to opening up so many avenues for opportunities for improvement. And we wanna make sure that we continue to have as broad a path into CUNY as possible. We don't wanna narrow the gates by increasing tuition and adding on fees and making it more restrictive for people who want to find ways to get ahead. And once again, in my opinion, compulsory education should be available for at least two years beyond post-secondary, beyond secondary school to provide that opportunity. But thank you so much for your panel. Look forward to working with you and engaging you further. Thank you, Chair Barron. Now that we have concluded the administration's testimony, we will now turn to public testimony. Once more, I'd like to remind everyone that individuals will be called up in panels of three or four. Council members who have questions for a particular panelist should use the raised hand function in Zoom. You will be called on after everyone on that panel has completed their testimony. For panelists, once your name is called, a member of our staff will unmute you and the Sergeant at Arms will give you the go ahead to begin after setting a timer. All testimony will be limited to three minutes. Please wait for the sergeant to announce that you may begin before starting your testimony. The first panel in order of speaking will be Nassim Amtazer, Calvin Herman, and Gregory Reyes. And I apologize if I mispronounce any names. Uh, Nassim? Your time begins now. Do you hear me? 
Yes, go Hello? ahead. Hello? Yes, go ahead. Chairman Barron, my name is Asim Ahmed Tasser. I am a Yemeni American, first generation student, born and raised in Brooklyn, New York. Um, activist, college now alum, and a full time student at Brooklyn College studying history and secondary education. During these times, I'm really trying to juggle this workload with online learning simultaneously ensuring I am healthy. Life has been so hard for everyone, including my parents, who are, who are um, including my, in, life has been so hard for everyone, including students who are in school, such as myself. During this transition, I've had friends who lost family. I lost really close friends myself and my father got sick. He was hospitalized for two weeks. Thankfully, he was not diagnosed with COVID. It was a hard moment for me to process, which made the conclusion of the semester a hard one. There was something that got me to the finish line. It was the experience I received from Brooklyn College, College Now. College Now taught me how to read, write, articulate myself clearly, how to communicate with professors, and gave me firsthand experience of what a college student's life is like. I walked into college with a 3.5 plus GPA from the courses I took at the College Now program. I was ahead of the game. I have to say that I am completing my bachelor's in two and a half years with a double major. I don't think anyone in the nation has ever done that before. This was because of all the resources and courses I took at College Now for free. CUNY has been overlooked for way too long. And it's important to note that there are many disadvantages students struggling COVID and online classes. When making structural changes in the field of higher education, please consider CUNY's mission statement since 1847, providing a quality accessible education regardless of background or means. This has led me to demand for three things. First, I believe that students should have the chance to file for credit, no credit for the summer and fall until we know where we are at because of all the stuff in the world that is on our plate, which was all out of, all out of our control. I'm taking classes at the moment for the summer and professors are still holding us accountable to the same level, even online, which is unfair because of our individual situations. Second, with CUNY budget cuts, I demand that college classes are free, just like the way Harvard classes online are, because many students have lost jobs, and this degree can be the opportunity for them to find jobs and give them, uh, and give their lives, to, and get their lives together during this pandemic. Thirdly, programs like New York City Men Teach and College Now should remain, and CUNY as well, should remain funded because. As a first generation student, it gave me the opportunity to experience college life, network with awesome professors and faculty on campus. With all this assistance and guidance, I, I was able to get through the remaining of the semester. Small things make a difference. Depriving our students from reaching their career goals is one of the last things we can afford right now with the current situation we're living in, especially in moments like now. We need to better our next generation so they can be the ones publishing and pushing policies and building on the great work. We can't have it end here. To conclude, I am working on gathering CUNY students' voices as one letter who express similar issues to I'm voice concerns. How can I get that to you? Please consider making CUNY classes free, keeping the credit, no credit policy options available for students in the summer and fall semester until we get back on campus. Additionally, keeping funding for college now programs in CUNY because of its advantages for disadvantaged students. In the words of Nelson Mandela, Education is the most powerful weapon which you can use to change the world. If you accommodate for us and for college now, the next generation will emerge and change the world. To learn more about my work, um, you can find me on social media and thank you, I have yielded my time. Next, we will hear from Calvin. Time begins now. Uh, good morning, Chair Barron and Committee on Higher Education. My name is Calvin Herman. I'm a first generation student and an alum of College Now, as well as a biology graduate of Hunter College. I'm here to bring attention to the College Now program specifically, which allows New York City Public High School students to take a college course in a CUNY campus. In high school, I took part in the College Now program and took a course, a college course, in uh, at Hunter College. An aspect that drew me to college now was the fact that if I successfully completed the program, I would earn college credit. The thought of getting ahead while in high school motivated me to apply to the program. The college now experience was extraordinary. Because all my classmates were motivated students, I was consistently challenged to do better through the duration of the program. I was able to network with students through various high schools in New York City. In short, I became a better student. 
In regards to the social aspect, partaking in the College Now program was the first time I found a strong academic support system. The College Now staff, particularly, particularly the coordinator, Mr. Erlin Mendez, has been a positive figure in my academic career, starting in high school all the way to college. I'm grateful that I was able to experience college early as part of College Now at no cost. The college readiness skills that I developed in high school, thanks to College Now, allowed me to achieve more than I could have ever imagined. I was accepted to Hunter College on a full tuition scholarship as a Macaulay Honor student. I want other students who may think that college is an exclusive place to enjoy all that college has to offer. This is why I'm urging you to keep College Now's budget intact. College Now has served half a million students since 2000 and it has been a critical nexus between CUNY and New York City Public High Schools. College Now is the paragon of CUNY's goal to providing high quality education for all New Yorkers, ensuring equal access and opportunity regardless of background or means, as well as the city's commitment to ensure that everyone has an equal chance in life. In the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic, it is ever important to preserve, preserve and expand funding for students of CUNY and younger students who depend on CUNY. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. And next we will hear from Gregory. Time begins now. Gregory Reyes, are you on? Thank you so much for muting me. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Thank you so much for your time, everyone. I am Gregory Reyes, a Hispanic student from New York. At this moment, I have struggled both with COVID as a student and also as a working part-time. I have been affected because I have not been able to comply with the necessary technological needs. I have not been provided with an adequate equipment with tablets or the computers provided. They are not enough to complete my work. I am a digital designer and I work with video as well as photos. To be able to edit such things, we need like high capable computers, which at the moment are not available. I think this is a very high concern for somebody as me and anybody working in the field of digital designers because we need this technology to actually work at all. I have also struggled with classes because of this. A lot of my classes also need this type of technology. I'm taking a coding class and I was unable to complete my classes because of this, leaving me with a bad grade. Besides that, I was also influenced by college now to become better and actually go through this adversity and come out on top. I was able to get all A's besides the computer class that I was taking and I was still able to try to contribute to my job in any way that I could, even with the laptops provided. I'm a Hispanic person who came from the Dominican Republic not too long ago. And the opportunity that college now gave me to be able to go to college as a first generation student was a really amazing one that I really cannot take back. They were able to allow me to network with millions of students across high schools and colleges I was able to be accepted to Lehman College. I'm a student right now at Lehman College, attaining my bachelor's in digital, digital computer information systems with graphical, graphic arts. I'm trying to get my bachelor's and hopefully make my family proud and make everybody around me proud. I want to be able to say I graduated and if I could do it, you can do it, no matter what the circumstances are even if you are underprivileged and even if you don't have their necessary requirements. College now allowed me to actually have the abilities to compete with people at this high level of college and articulate myself in front of others. Without college now, I really don't think I would be in college and I really would appreciate if you could keep the funds. But besides that, I think it has helped millions of people since it actually started since 2000. I believe they help people CUNY wide around half a million students have been held by them and continue to be held by that them in high schools. Thank you. 
Uh, I want to thank the panel uh, for coming and sharing your testimony with us. We appreciate hearing always from those who are most uh, directly involved in the CUNY system, and that would be the students. I want to commend you for the great academic achievements that you've gotten. 3.5, that's fantastic. I want to encourage you. And to um, Gregory Reyes, I'm trying to get a better understanding. So you were able to get digital device from CUNY, but you weren't able to have the other types of technology that you needed for the program that you were in? Is that what you were saying? Gregory Reyes? Well, if he's hearing us, perhaps he can uh, send us a note or send us a text so that we'll be able to, to get that answer. Thank you to the panel and I'd like- Thank you, sorry to oh. interrupt. Yes, that's exactly right. Okay, so you weren't able to access the higher uh, level equipment that you needed for your program. Did that impact your continuing in the course for that semester? Yes, yeah, so I am actually benefiting from the credit no credit policy that is taking place at the moment which is okay, really so helpful. Then that, because you weren't able to access that, they modified what the requirements were. Is that what you're saying? Yes, the computers were not at a high enough level to actually do any of the coding necessary for the course. Okay. So I spoke with the teacher and I told them I will be opting for the credit, no credit. Okay, great. Thank you so much. I wanna thank the panel for their testimony and you can call the next panel, please. Thank you, Chair Barron. Before I call the next panel, I'd like to remind you that all testimony will be limited to three minutes. Please wait for the sergeant to announce that you may begin before starting your testimony. The next panel will be Barbara Bowen, followed by Andrea Vasquez, followed by Yassine Edwards, followed by Catherine Rakowski. Ms. Bowen, you may begin your testimony after the sergeant at arms gives you the go ahead. Your time begins now. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Chairperson Barron. It's very nice to see you and see you well. And uh, thank you for holding this. Um, I, I, we will have written testimony, but really my message today um, is that the reimagining of New York City that so many of us urgently are calling for and people in the streets are calling for needs to start with ending CUNY's institutional poverty. CUNY has been institutionally poor for too long. And in fact, if we were in this current political moment um, and uh, with so many of us calling for non-police solutions to the deep problems in our society, we, if we didn't have a City University of New York, people would be crying out to invent one. Um, and in fact, we have this incredible resource and yet it is in a constant state of poverty. So my testimony today, Andrea is gonna speak about one particular part, but I'm gonna focus on funding um, and some subjects that have come up already. Um, at this moment, uh, it's distressing to hear any discussion of cuts for CUNY and of potential layoffs. I know we heard earlier about scenarios for layoffs, but in fact, some adjuncts have received notices of non-reappointment for the fall. Some continuing education teachers have also. Certain programs have been cut and uh, cut the uh, chairs of different departments are being told to plan for 25 or 35% cuts in courses. That will be devastating. And the union's position is that now in this moment when CUNY is more important than ever, the university and the council should be taking the position that there can be no cuts to CUNY. If there is going to be redirection of funding for New York City, and we hope there will be, some of that funding must go to CUNY. In a moment where New Yorkers, especially those who have borne the biggest cost of the pandemic, will be turning for new education and new skills to the City University in ways that they may never have needed it before. That's exactly the moment for new investment, not for cuts and layoffs. Um, and so we call on you to help our CUNY administration to stand up and take the position of defending cuts, defending CUNY against cuts, not normalizing them. 
Um, and I see uh, also we should talk about if we had more time, the CARES Act money, very important to know and uh, that the CARES Act also includes a provision for keeping employees on payroll. Employees should be kept on payroll if they receive CARES Act money. We call on the council to make sure that those employees, that all employees at CUNY are kept on the payroll and we support the students in their demand for no more tuition increases and none of the so-called wellness fee. Um, I believe I'm out of time, but we thank you. Um, and we call on the council to uh, join us and take the stance that CUNY must be defended and have reinvested. Time expired. Thank you. The next panelist may begin, Andrea Vasquez. Thank you. Hi, my name is Andrea Vasquez. Time Be begins now. Hi, I'm Andrea Vasquez, first vice president of the Professional Staff Congress. Thank you, Chairperson Barron and members of the committee for holding this hearing. As you know, in addition to representing the full-time and part-time faculty at CUNY, the PSC also represents approximately 7,000 professional staff, the most racially diverse sector of our membership. Professional staff are pre predominantly people of color, most are women. They and hundreds of CUNY librarians had a very different and frightening experience when teaching went remote in mid-March. CUNY gave very little guidance to colleges and so presidents made individual decisions about who would be considered an essential worker. The PSC campaigned for many long weeks as colleges continued to call in professional staff and librarians traveling on trans public transportation. Now that we are discussing the return to work and the different phases of that return, these thousands of employees are fearful of the decisions CUNY will make and fearful for their lives and the health of their families, their communities and the students they serve. We have lost far too many already. Our members feel that CUNY must do a better job of protecting the CUNY community in the months to come. Requiring staff to return prematurely or with an inadequate pr protections will be yet another example of how the effects of the COVID-19 crisis fall more harshly on New Yorkers of color. The union has made 10 impact bargaining demands related to health and safety and the eventual reopening of CUNY facilities. The terms and conditions of the return to work must be the subject of collective bargaining. Oversight on the issues of returning to campus cannot wait until phase four or the end of the summer. Right now, there are many students in the sciences who, in order to graduate and move into jobs, must do their clinical work and research in labs on campus. Everyone wants our students to graduate and launch their careers, but it simply cannot be done at the expense of the college lab technician or faculty advisor. So I end by emphasizing two things. As a university, we must consider every member of the community, CUNY community and the CUNY workforce equally. We cannot allow anyone to enter our colleges unless we can provide them with the proper assurances and protections. And second, even after an agreed upon time to return to normal work is determined, if an employee feels that it would be too dangerous for them to return to work, either because of their own health risks or that of an elderly or compromised family member, they should be allowed to continue to work from home until a later date. It is the just thing to do, it is the responsible thing to do, it is the moral thing to do, and it will help us stay CUNY strong. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. The next panelist is Yassim Edwards. Time begins now. You appear to be having some technical difficulties. Um, we will skip you um, and go to Catherine Rakowski next. Time begins now. Hello, uh, my name is Catherine Rakowski and I was born and raised and currently reside in Queens, New York City. I'm also a former New York City public school student and college now alum. College Now not only gave me the opportunity in high school to earn college credits towards my bachelor degree, but also gave me the necessary skills to easily excel in the transition from high school to college. I know many of my fellow classmates who have also participated in the College Now program are also extremely grateful for the opportunity College Now gave them to be able to earn college credit while still in high school with no economic barriers. With the global pandemic we are currently experiencing with COVID-19 and consequential, consequential economic crisis, I was disturbed to hear that College Now's funding is at risk. With this economic crisis hitting the middle and lower classes harder than anyone else, 
New York City public school students need now more than ever equal and accessible programs for higher education. College now is an essential program for our society and for the future of our diverse city. Programs like College Now, at the very least, should not have their budgets cut, but if anything, College Now programs should be invested in even more and expanded. If the, if the city continues to invest more in police enforcement and less in education, it will be detrimental to the future of our city. Uh, respectfully, Katie Rakowski, um, and I yield my time. Thank you. Uh, at this time, we'll circle back to Yassim Edwards. Time begins now. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, okay. So my name is Yasmin Edwards and I am an associate professor at Bronx Community College and a CUNY alum. Uh, as I observe the choices being made by the CUNY leadership in what they describe as balancing the college budgets, I wonder where is the shared sacrifice? In a period of record unemployment, a global health crisis and social upheaval not seen in 50 years, at Bronx Community College, the administration chose to cut 60% of college assistance and adjuncts are being targeted for non-reappointment. Now this follows the classic corporate code to target the most vulnerable for elimination. Bronx Community College is a public college. It's not a corporation but our leadership has chosen to operate like the corporate uh, leaders on Wall Street whose greed and graft, in my humble opinion, has this, is destroying our country. Uh, CUNY's choice to emulate the corporate style budgeting will yield the same results. While COVID-19 is decimating the lives of, of uh, the poor and people of color on our campus, our administration's actions reveal a lack of compassion and abdication of responsibility for the lives of the lowest paid and most vulnerable members of the Bronx Community College community. They have chosen to make a group of workers that are 80% Black and Latinx jobless. They have chosen to make a group of workers that are 60% women jobless. And the harshest blow is that they have chosen to make a group of workers who have in their ranks many Bronx Community College graduates jobless. We have taught, we have nurtured these students, and now we're preparing to abandon them to a cruel fate. Now, amazingly, the highly paid CUNY leadership has managed to avoid making many of the, any of the sacrifices that they have imposed on the rest of the CUNY community in this time of crisis. So again, I ask, where is the shared sacrifice? I wanna thank the panel for their presentation and I just have uh, a few questions. Uh, first questions will go to Barbara Bowen. And in, in her testimony, she talked about the fact that we've got to defend CUNY, not defund CUNY, and to talk about any cuts that are being proposed. And can you speak, Barbara, a little bit about using CARES money to keep employees? Because that's what I asked the administration and they sort of, the CUNY administration, they sort of went around that. But if you have any specifics or particulars, I'd like to hear you share that. Um, yes, I'd be happy to. Thank you. Um, the CARES Act uh, provision 18006 uh, is uh, titled Continu Continued Payment to Employees, um, and it states that any educational uh, higher education institution um, that receives funds under the Education Stabilization Fund, which is this part of the CARES Act, shall to the greatest extent practicable continue to pay its employees and contractors during the period of any disruptions or closures related to coronavirus. Um, there are restrictions on the use of funds as uh, Vice Chancellor Sapienza said, but the um, section 18004 that describes the uses of funds um, says the funds received uh, can cover any costs associated with significant changes to the delivery of instruction due to the coronavirus. And then it goes on exempting some uh, payment for religious activities and uh, so on. Um, 
uh, there are, uh, the CARES Act money is targeted and is specific money, but it also includes a provision that's right there in the act um, that uh, demands, it's not, a, it's not an expression of a wish, it's a requirement that higher education institutions and others that receive the Education Stabilization Fund, the CARES Act money, some of which CUNY has already uh, um, received as we heard earlier, um, that they shall to the greatest extent practicable uh, continue to pay its employees. So um, we, we call on the council to ask whether CUNY is in fact doing that. Um, uh, they're keeping people on due to the disruptions and also using the funds um, to associated with any significant changes to delivery instruction. Those are not incompatible. Um, adjuncts are crucial for the um, instruction throughout the university. And, and this is a point I think Yasmin was pointing to in a way that because CUNY has uh, the majority of its courses taught by adjuncts, 12,000 adjuncts, in a sense, a plan that calls for um, termination of adjuncts or a non reappointment of adjuncts, in a sense, takes advantage of the already um, unjust structure of employment at CUNY and uses that um, vulnerability and precarity of those workers to signal that um, hundreds of them or thousands may lose their jobs. So John Jay College put out a notice that 437 adjuncts would be scheduled to be laid off. Uh, Brooklyn called for 25% reduction in courses, Staten Island for 35% reduction. So um, there's a need for more investment. The CARES Act is a one-time a uh, non-recurring investment, but it could help in this crisis. And also there's a need for the city finally to address the fact that the city's contribution to the four-year colleges has not increased even with the rate of inflation for 20 years. If New York City is serious about the communities of color who have been devastated by systemic racism and by COVID, then New York needs to put money into CUNY. That's all there is to it. Uh, thank you. And to Yasneen Edwards, if you could unmute her, I just wanted to ask her, in terms of what you're seeing at, uh, at your institution, have there already been staff who have received notices that they will not be returning? Yes, Councilwoman uh, uh, Barron. Yeah, we've uh, recently been told that, and this was very distressing to the department chairs, because we were told that over actually between 60 to 70% of college assistants would be let go. Why is this significant? We're moving our courses online. Many college assistants work in support of uh, students. And one of those roles is as tutors. We're, um, Increasing the class sizes. If you increase the class size, you should mm -hmm. I right. think, also increase the number of tutors who are able to support the students. So mm -hmm. I'm going to give um, our CUNY leadership the benefit of the doubt that they think it can work the way it's set up. But if you work in the classroom with the students, you know the way things have been designed will not work well for the students. Right, and that was the point that I was raising to the administration that you can't just think that because we're now uh, using more online instruction that you won't have an increased need for assistance and for personnel that can support that program. Um, I think that concludes my questions. I'm glad that you came and we are struggling and we're fighting and we're continuing to raise our voices to say that CUNY has got to be the institution that we look to to help get us through this pandemic and get back into what's going to be on the other side. So I thank you for your presentation. And Mr. Council, Mr. Senegal, if there are other panels. Yes, I will now announce the next panel. Sakia Fletcher, Zalima Blair, and Terrence Blackman in that order. Sakia Fletcher, let me begin your testimony when the sergeant tells you it's okay to begin. Your time begins now. Hello, good afternoon. Thank you for having me. 
um, Council Member, Councilwoman Barron. Um, I just wanna get right into it. My name is Sakia Fletcher. I am the SGA, the current SGA president of Mega Everest College. I want, a couple, I want to talk about a couple of things today and that is the impact of COVID-19 on the Mega Everest College students. I want to also talk about sound leadership at that institution, institutionalized racism, and also the funding of CUNY. So due to COVID-19, Mega Evers College students experience loss of wages, lack of access to technology, uh, food insecurities, homeschooling, children's in difficulties, homelessness, loss of health, in health insurance, hospitalizations, and death, disproportionately in comparison to other CUNY campuses. Um, I want to read you some of the student testimonies that I received. Um, students actually uh, emailed me and I received phone calls from students during this time. So one student said, I am incredibly stressed. I have no choice but to stay home because I, I'm high risk and even more so with asthma. And normally I, normally I love being at home, but I've been home for, for maybe two weeks and it's driving me crazy and making my depression worse. School is also stressing me out so much. I'll read one more. And this particular student is an international student. So she doesn't receive uh, financial aid. And she, so she reads, uh, one student state, stated that COVID-19 pandemic was really, effect, uh, really affecting her emotionally as she witnessed so many people losing her life from, from this deadly virus. She became depressed and anxious and her, and as her small island of Grenada was also highly affected by the coronavirus. I sometimes have a difficult time completing my school assignments as I can't, as I can't help but worry about my family at home in Grenada. Um, our students were disproportionately affected by the virus um, because most of them are uh, predominantly black and also in the Brooklyn uh, communities. So during the height of this COVID-19 pandemic, Mega Evers College President Rudy Koo publicly sought employment with the DeKalb Georgia School District, announcing his departure at a crucial and vulnerable time for Mega Evers College students. When students need a strong, leader, strong and dedicated leadership, he was not there. This also left students uh, in a, in a state of vulnerability. At that time, the Mega Evers College student government had to step up and take the place. We actually came up with a way to uh, give $50,000 to students. We solidified in the in April to give $50,000 to students because the college was not did, have, did not have a plan for our students. Also, I wanna talk about lastly, is this the, the CUNY in terms of um, institutionalized? Lastly. So CUNY gives, CUNY gives a discretion to each campus of how to implement the response of emergencies to each campus. However, at Mega Evers College, due to this discretion, it was extreme delay in resources and, and, and implementing of resources because we did not have that sound leadership during this crucial time. Also, just in terms of Equitable, equitable resources given to Mega Evers College. Mega Evers College for years has received inequitable resources across CUNY. In terms of dorms, we are the only senior college that does not have dormitories, but we have the highest population of homelessness. We also have released, re received the least in funding when it comes to capital and, pro and projects. And also when it comes to our disabled students, I am a disabled student um, in the transition from online, um, from in-class to online, we had no additional help. We had no resources and it was extremely difficult. We are asking that the city council support aiding, uh, support aiding a uh, free CUNY and also take the money to be reallocated from the NYPD's budget. We are also asking for a tuition freeze. We are also asking for the immediate resignation of President Dr. Crew. We are also asking that the no credit credit option be extended until the summer. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. The next to testify will be Zalima Blair, followed by Terrence Blackman. Time begins now. Okay, good afternoon, uh, Council Member Barron. Uh, Majority Leader Combo and other members of the panel, CUNY Chancellery. My name is Dr. Zalima Blair. I'm a professor at Mega Arvis College of CUNY, Department of Public Administration located in the School of Business. I am also the Vice Chair of the College Council, the governance body for Mega Arvis College. 
Hence, I'm a member also of the faculty governance leaders in CUNY. And so I receive abundance of information pertaining to guidance given to administrations of CUNY colleges. During COVID-19, the FGLs, faculty governance leaders, received daily and then subsequently weekly guidance from the chancellery on how to proceed with the remainder of the academic semester. However, these guidance memos receive very little input from faculty. Yes, this is a violation of shared governance. However, this is not the sole reason for which I raised this issue. I raised the issue of faculty input because, input because faculty have direct contact with students. In some cases, experience the same difficulties as students with respect to resources, that is adjuncts, and have intimate knowledge about the culture of the population that they serve, as well as the organizational culture that guides the functions and processes of a college. Further, as information become readily available to the individual campuses, my campus in particular did not seek a broad input from the faculty, Megarevis College. They were given in the format as updates as opposed to guidance. The students, however, who educated themselves on the use of their student technology fee, activity fee, and other reserved resources created a process for which students could receive emergency funds. Going forward, it is important that the chancellery, the board of trustees, and all elected officials take into consideration that this is not enough to consider tuition. That is not enough to consider tuition where a college education is concerned. CUNY may be a community university. However, students still must have a place to live, food to eat, health insurance, textbooks, a computer, and Wi-Fi. This is what room and board is all about. CUNY cannot take for granted that our students have all the basic necessities. CUNY should also reorganize the basic necessities for college students, inclu which include a laptop and Wi-Fi. The board, in quote unquote room and board, includes a how a student onboards into college. For onboarding to be equitable across all CUNY campuses, CUNY must review the demographics of their student population with respect to neighborhoods, zip codes, and the like. It is only then that they will be able to devise a universal plan that appears to be equitable. As a tenured full professor who was once an adjunct, it is important that we take into consideration that some adjuncts, given their salary, are worse off economically than some of our students, not to minimize the hardship that students suffer. For most, this is their only form of income. Thus, it is important that enough technological resources and professional development are available to assist with the process I'm of expired. teaching. Throughout this COVID-19 pandemic, our adjuncts were severely disadvantaged. However, their resources were not considered. Instead, they received a poor evaluation, albeit informal. This in turn would have serious implications for whether they were able to continue teaching at their respective campuses. CUNY must understand their infrastructure so that faculty, staff, and students will be able to survive any emergency, disaster, or pandemic with minimal damage. Some suggestions for improvement may include consultation with, at the very least, internal stakeholders, implementing more guidance around STF so that students have the requisite materials needed for onboarding and being a productive college students. STF should be used to improve the experience of teaching and learning as opposed to paying for salaries, the infrastructural needs that a college should have already paid for. Faculty are given greater resources. Adjuncts who make up the majority of our teaching staff are given a greater voice. That's what we're asking for. And in the plan and implementation of our academic infrastructure. Finally, we hope that CUNY would appoint an interim at Megarevis College who has the competency and the academic leadership and the existential and political skills to deal with both. It's not just political on one end and then the next president be academic on another end. They must be integrated, academic times uh, uh, community oriented, times politically inclined, times civic engagement. Thank you. Thank you. The next panelist will be Terrence Blackman. Your time begins now. Good afternoon, Chairperson Barron and members of the City Council on Higher Education Committee. It is with great humility that I speak to you this morning on the intersection of COVID-19 and the City University of New York. I am Terrence Blackman, Associate Professor of Mathematics, 25 years of service at, the city, at Medgar Evers College, a founding faculty member of our mathematics program, the first black chair of our mathematics department, and the first black males to serve as Dean of our School of Science. Medgar Evers College is a predominantly black, is the only predominantly black institution of higher education in New York State. 
Chancellor Matos Rodriguez has announced that Pre President Rudolph Kuhn will serve a final year at Medgar Evers College and retire at the end of 2021 after the DeKalb school, school Board has rejected his appointment as school superintendent. In our COVID impacted world, this decision puts Medgar Evers College at risk of being a failed higher education institution. Chancellor Matos's announcement demands the very serious attention of this committee. The coronavirus is killing Blacks and Latinos in New York City at twice the rate at which it's killing white New Yorkers. For clarity, the death rate for 100,000 for Blacks is 20, for whites it's 10. In Williamsburg, Crung Heights, Flatbush, Kensington, and East New York, the death rate exceeds 300 per 100,000. In East New York, the death rate is 600, 60 times as much per 100,000. It is the highest in New York City. Medgar-Evers College has a satellite campus in East New York, and its main campus is in Crung Heights. It ought to play a critical role in supporting the central Brooklyn community as we reemerge from the shadow of COVID-19. However, our School of Science, Health and Technology has thus far played no meaningful role in support of our community's fight against the coronavirus. And there is no plan for saying. This lack of planning, this lack of meaningful engagement with the community is indicative of the failed leadership of the crew Opereke leadership team. Given our historical mission and function, it is essential that we examine and understand the possibilities for Medgar Evers and the critical role that its leadership must play in shaping the institution and supporting the community that emerges post-COVID. It is evident, as has been said on the panel, that the main impact of the various scenarios will be on the persistence of our students. Our students and our faculty have struggled to adapt to online coursework. Medgar Evers College is an institution with a limited record of creating compelling, a compelling online experience. We have very few students in a fully online environment. We will be seriously hurt if our current students are dissatisfied with our digital offerings and decide to go elsewhere. The warning signs are flashing. As of 0603-2020, there's 18% decline in continuing student enrollment when compared to where we were in 2019. We have lost over the course of the crew administration, a total of 903 students. That amounts at $600, $6,000 per student to a budget loss of $5,400,000. Our enrollment is trending down and there is a lack of a clear and credible plan for this new academic year. Our mission to connect young people, particularly those to, from central Brooklyn to opportunities through scholarship, teaching, learning, community service. Our mission to honor the memory and the work of Medgar Wiley, Medgar Wiley Evers cannot be accomplished under a crew Okereke leadership team. This continued presence at this moment of the pandemic poses a grave risk for the college. It is time for this committee to seriously demand that we end the benign neglect of Medgar Evers College and appoint a competent and committed leadership now. June 2021 will be too late. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Is that the completion of that panel? Thank you. I want to thank the panel for your uh, presentation. And I just want to say that in terms of the leadership of any institution, that process is in fact determined by the chancellor and his search committee. It has been an issue that I have addressed uh, for many years in talking about how the community needs to have not just input, but decision-making power in how, chancellor, how presidents of universities are selected. Uh, it has increased over the last five years to have less and less community involvement even in knowing who the candidates are and in making that final appointment and that final selection. So it's an issue about which I'm very much uh, concerned to make sure that we have in fact leadership that reflects, respects and inspires the population and the students and involves the uh, leadership of faculty 
which I'm hearing is not very um, reflected in the, in the administration there. So I'm very much concerned about that. I have expressed part of that concern and I will be talking again with the chancellor about the situation there. Also concerned because it uh, is an issue that has been brought by the, uh, the, the, by Merle Edwards as well. And certainly we know we not want to respect the family and make sure that we're doing as much as we can to edify the university named for one of our great, great civil rights activists and gave his life for what he believed in. So I do want to thank you for your testimony and it's an issue that I will pursue further. Council can call the next panel. Thank you, Chair Barron. The next panel will be a panel of five uh, speaking in this order. Nicholas Freudenberg, Jupad Mamun, Sadoni Elwood, Alex Pence, and Michelle Markman. Mr. Freudenberg, you may begin when the Sergeant at Arms cues you. Your time begins now. Hi, I'm Nick Freudenberg. I'm a distinguished professor of public health at the City University of New York and a graduate of Hunter College. Uh, thank you for having me here today. Uh, we completed a survey of 2,300 CUNY students in April uh, 2020, supported by the Office of Academic Affairs, and that's what I'd like to talk about today, and a more detailed report will also be made available. Our key finding is that the COVID-19 pandemic has caused a significant amount of distress for CUNY students. We found that the rate of depression, anxiety, and food insecurity have doubled since our last Healthy CUNY survey in early 2018. Uh, in 2018, 16% of CUNY students reported that they worried that they would run out of food before they could buy more. In April 2020, 50%, more than triple the 2018 rate, reported this level of food insecurity. Students also reported that the pandemic was disrupting their focus on school. 26% of our students believe that as a result of the pandemic, they will graduate later than expected. And 29% no longer know when they will graduate, showing that more than half our students believe the epidemic has slowed their academic progress. I believe that CUNY, the city council, and the governments of New York City and New York State have a health and a moral responsibility to ensure that no CUNY student should fail to graduate because of unmet needs imposed by the COVID-19 pandemic. And to achieve that goal, I recommend first, that CUNY should strengthen its formal partnerships with community providers to meet student basic needs, to make it easier to get services in the communities they live. Second, CUNY should develop a coordinated university-wide online and digital basic needs platform to link students with basic needs, assistance and services. Particularly important that that be centralized. Three, CUNY should launch coordinated university-wide campaigns to enroll CUNY students who are eligible in SNAP, Medicaid and other public benefit programs. Our data show that many more students are eligible than now enroll. Four, CUNY should ensure online educational programs are tailored to meet the needs of students with special needs, such as parents, those with disabilities, or with limited access to Wi-Fi or internet. And finally, New York City and state governments should provide CUNY with the resources it needs to meet high levels of student needs during this time of economic and social disruption. CUNY is an essential institution for New York City and supporting it now Oops, in this fine. crisis is the best investment that the city can make. Thank you. Thank you. We will next hear from Jupad Mamun. Your time begins now. Uh, <clears throat> hello, uh, okay, so hi everyone. My name is Jupad Mamun and I'm a student at CUNY Queens College and I'm currently the president of the college's committee for disabled students. I'm here today to talk about the importance of <clears throat> funding CUNY, especially in the wake of COVID-19, and to share the experiences of some students I know. 
as has been pointed out before, COVID is not equal opportunity. It has impacted disadvantaged communities disproportionately. Black and brown folks, poor folks, immunocompromised folks, and people with disabilities, and the people who exist at the intersection of these identities. Many people have already pointed out that um, the people running, that have been running in New York City, essential workers, are primarily minorities and or economically disadvantaged. And I believe all of us recognize the pervasive impact of systemic racism. Unfortunately, people with disabilities and systemic problem of ableism are often left out of these conversations. Roughly, for example, in conversations about police brutality, roughly a third to a half of people who are extrajudicially killed by police are people with disabilities. Sandra Bland, Eric Garner, Freddie Gray, Tanisha Anderson, Deborah Danner, Ezel Ford, Alfred Olango, Keith Lamont, and many more all line the intersection of race and disability. In the context of higher education, students with disabilities are underrepresented and face additional challenges. As unemployment skyrockets, students in general face uncertain futures, but students with disabilities who are often especially dependent on their families are, are worried. These students face inequities from our healthcare system as well. With the transition to online courses and quarantine lockdown, students with disabilities have faced, again, further challenges. Students with ADHD have told me about how, because many of them are living in cramped apartment, uh, apartments, pardon, um, they've had a harder time at schoolwork. They've had a hard time uh, focusing. One of the services that students rely on is in our Office of Special Services, a room where they can take tests without distractions. Um, and they just, they aren't getting that and they don't have the privilege or the opportunity to be, to have their own separate rooms some of these times. Autistic students that I know have struggled greatly with the transition to online courses and the breakdown of their routines. Immunocompromised students have been terrified for their health and other students who rely on healthcare aids have been increasingly worried about bringing, the, of, about people bring the disease in and about whether or not they'll be able to get assistance. <clears throat> There've, there've also been students who, <clears throat> pardon, <coughs> sorry, I also had COVID-19 and uh, my lungs are still scarred, but I'm not the only one. There's lots of people who I know, peers of mine, who whether they're family members are struggling with newfound disabilities, newfound limitations on what they can do. And they found that many other things that have been touched upon already, like the counseling system, uh, are under-equipped to deal, to deal with them. Our Office of Special Services have, over the past few years have faced cuts to hours. And when we talk about student retention, uh, keeping students in, uh, people, students with disabilities are especially vulnerable. And I fear that uh, as this, as we continue to face this Thank you, just last note. In NARA, where we're beginning to revisit conversations about equity for the marginalized and justice for our communities, the continued underfunding of CUNY must be recognized as part of systemic problem. Especially in the wake of COVID, CUNY is in dire need of further funding. If anyone can use more resources, more funding, less disinvestment, it would be the students that the CUNY serve. Thank you. Thank you. We will next hear from Sidoni Elwood. Time begins now. Yes, hello. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, for 10 years, I have helped students at Kingsborough Community College locate proper research resources, um, assess their academic writing needs, connect them to mental health services and our urban farm, encourage them to make long lasting relationships with their professors, written recommendation letters, attended graduations, colored with their, colored with their toddlers and hush their newborns as they sleep, to sleep as they sat exams, purchased meals out of my pocket, and so much more. It could take me a week to recall the many instances I went outside the parameters of my job description to assist a student on any given day in the last decade. Last year, I earned $29,000. Clearly, money is not my motive. My responsibility as an adjunct CLT in the Writing Center is to undergird the learning experiences and processes of Kingsborough students. I do all the good I can, whenever I can, however I can, as it is my goal to make a tangible difference in our students' lives. During this spring semester, I was told for a de after a decade of dedication and excellence, I would no longer have a job due to budget cuts and low enrollment. I received a reappointment letter with an allocation of zero hours. 
Before I could process the loss of income and health insurance, the first thing that brought tears to my eyes was the question of what about the students? Who's going to support them now? I then thought about the writing fellows I work with each year, guiding them through the complexities of CUNY and pairing them with students, providing them with experiences that serves as the foundation of their teaching philosophy. The work I do for the Writing Center changes lives. It changes CUNY and our broader community for the better. But bleeding must stop and redundancies must be eliminated. How can student retention at a community college be redundant? Never mind that we have deans whose responsibilities overlap and no one's considering eliminating their six figure salaries. We who work diligently to make CUNY truly work for the city for the least of these are the ones who must go. Our $29,000 to $56,000 a year is the greatest strain on the university? I don't think so. If we're here for students and if we believe that education is the great equalizer, why are we ripping their support system to shreds? Why must anyone who spent a decade of their life working to enhance student and faculty development be discarded like a filthy rag? Thank you. We will next hear from Alex Pence. Time begins now. All right, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Alex Pence. I'm a continuing education teacher of English for speakers of other languages at LaGuardia Community College. Um, I intend to speak specifically to the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic on adult continuing education programs. Because my colleagues and I work in continuing education, our programs have traditionally received relatively less funding compared to the degree granting programs we work alongside. Uh, this has resulted in two major consequences. The first is that in spite of often having, having the same amount of credentials and or experience, we universally receive considerably less pay and little to no benefits. This lack of provisions means that in order to make ends meet, we need to teach up to six classes or more at a time. Um, this amount of work enables us to make ends meet. So fewer classes has resulted in many of, our being, many of us being unable to afford basic necessities. Uh, the second major consequence is that our programs are more directly dependent on the tuition of the students in our programs. As a result of the pandemic, students in our classes are largely out of work or working fewer hours, and many didn't receive a federal stimulus due to their immigration statuses. Uh, thus, the majority have been unable to afford classes or make the transition to remote learning for lack of technological access. Enrollment is extremely low across continuing education programs and across, it sounds like every program, meaning that our programs have been severely downsized or shuttered altogether, as has been happening during the COVID-19 pandemic to programs across the city, such as the historic ELI program at Queens College. The largely low income and immigrant students in continuing education programs have continuously, I'm sorry, have historically been underserved due to a gross lack of funding distribution, which in itself is unjust. However, this low funding has gone towards pushing their instructors who have made it their professional purpose to help members of our communities access the opportunities that socioeconomic and racial equity ostensibly provide, provides them into financially desperate and precarious situations. The majority of my colleagues are uninsured and juggling two or more jobs, many of which have all but vanished in the last few months. In addition to the deserving causes and other testimonies you'll hear and have heard today, um, such as the gutting of CUNY ASAP, increased funding from the city would mean that continuing continue education programs would be able to lower the rate of tuition in continuing ed programs to offset the financial difficulties of the students in our classes who are the immigrants that define and form the lifeblood of our city. This would then have the effect of keeping our programs open and it would provide employment to teachers like myself. Your decision to help these programs and communities continue to survive these difficult times is paramount. Thank you for your time. Thank you. We will next hear from Michelle Markman. Time begins now. Hi everyone. Today I would like to talk about the College Now program, which as you may, which as you may know is a program where high school students can take college classes. Having been a student in the program and now as a mentor, 
I've witnessed how much of an impact the program has had on so many students' lives, such as economically disadvantaged students and first-generation college students. The program shows the students who participate that they can be successful in a college setting and it provides them their first few credits of college free. This is a prime motivator to get students started on pursuing higher education. I would now like to highlight several aspects about the College Now program that show just how important the program is to me and so many other students. The first story that comes to mind is when I needed extra help in math while in high school. The College Now office helped me find a class that perfectly matched my skill set. The class provided me with the extra practice that I needed, and I was able to catch up. Eventually, after taking more math classes through their program, I was able to take three semesters of calculus. In addition, the College Now program also provides enrichment over the summer. They give students the opportunity to be exposed to science classes and science research, in addition to social science and humanity programs that include group trips and an environmental program. In particular, the summer program gave me the opportunity as a high school student to spend the summer assisting in a biology lab that was conducting cancer research. Furthermore, when I became a college now mentor, I quickly realized that there were some students who did not speak English well and who also struggled significantly with the material. I saw the dedication of the professors and college now staff as they did everything in their power to work with these students. Thus, the College Now program has had a great impact on my life and many others around me. I am now a student at the Macaulay Honors College, and I believe that the College Now program was a major factor in my educational path. I hope that this program remains intact for a long time to help students realize the benefits of college and to give them the confidence that they can, act that they can actually succeed in college classes. Thank you. Does that conclude this panel? If so, please call the next panel forward. Thank you, Chair Barron. The next panel will be in the order of speaking, Nathan Schrader, Jeanette Batiste, Monica Courtney, and Sylvia Gonzalez. Mr. Schrader, you may begin after the Sergeant cues you. You may begin now. Thank you, Council. Thank you, Council Chair. Um, thank you, everybody, and um, I appreciate your attention. Uh, I'm not going to take up too much time, and I think that a lot of what I have to say is uh, has already been said by a number of uh, members of the panel. Um, I'm a, an adjunct lecturer at LaGuardia Community College and Hunter College, and um, like a lot of my part-time working colleagues. Um, we are some of the hardest hit by the COVID pandemic and the uh, economic healthcare and um, job security effects uh, caused by it. Um, we lack the, um, many of us lack the technology, healthcare coverage and job security if we get sick with the disease. Um, and following the announcement of the movement to remote learning, which was by the way, announced on Twitter, um, we are kind of the face of the university to our students. Um, funding part-time workers is crucial to the future of public education to CUNY um, and to our students, because as has been said before by the uh, by um, panelists, um, adjuncts make up the bulk of the workforce at CUNY and um, the proposed cuts of up to one third of classes in the face of increased enrollment is only going to hurt us part-time workers. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, I, like many of my colleagues, have received a non-reappointment letter, um, which was sent at, was which was said to be an accident uh, on the part of human resources, but only increases our feeling of uh, insecurity uh, in our jobs. Um, 
Also, I believe that the move to uh, remote learning was not handled very well on the part of the uh, school administration and left a lot of us part-time workers increasingly with more work to try to cater to our students' needs, um, many of whom needed additional support, including students with disabilities and students who needed other support, such as second language stu students, um, and uh, I think it has proved to be pedagogically unsound in terms of teaching writing, at least in my experience. Um, and uh, to kind of put a cap on it, uh, city and state funding is necessary to save part-time jobs at CUNY, which again represent a, a majority of the face-to-face the -face interactions that students have with uh, the college. And uh, as the chair observed earlier in the meeting, we um, wanted a pay increase and we didn't receive what we wanted. Um, and now I just want uh, CUNY to kind of hold up their end of the bargain by uh, preserving part-time jobs and um, ensuring security for the next semester and into the future for the sake of uh, part-time workers, as well as for our students who depend on us. Thank you very much. Thank you. The next panelists will be Jeanette Batiz. Your time may begin now. Good afternoon, chair and panel and committee. I am Jeanette Batiz, working in Bronx Community College in the Biological Science and Medical Lab Technology Program, the Division of Microbiology, including our nurses. I am the tech that set up all the organisms for our students, including setups and deprivation, medias and solutions, et cetera. I'm the vice chapter of the CLT across campus in CUNY, and our goal is to support education. CLT supports educational research, physics, phys physics, biological science, graphic, performing arts, computer science, electronic media, and name a few, I only name a few. But they, through cross campus, may, in diverse jobs in different departments, we are the workforce behind CUNY science and technology. About 500 of us are underpaid, edge on CLTs who are significant risk of jobless due to potential city and state budget. CLT at CUNY were affected with the coronavirus. I'm um, sorry about that. Much like everyone else, we move our teaching online. So we are necessary educators, staff, and faculty in many features with Blackboard, utilize APN, management, software license, necessary conduct classes. We took the responsibility to ensure staff and students and faculty can access these materials and troubleshoot issues and help with IT and department. CLTs are different departments through CUNY and form essential part of CUNY system and science lab. Without a full time aid and C in part time CLT CUNY will be unable to deliver quality education to students. Strength removing or abandoning these label would demand the schools to the workforce to rely their health and their students will we serve. I'm urging you to help and protect the jobs of all CUNY workers, including part-time CLTs. When students return to BCC after Cronora pandemic, what will they return to if they force, the workforce has been hurt and the service are poor? We should take steps to, insecure, to secure our workers so they can deliver the results that keeps students coming back to BCC and across our campuses. Without reliable workers who will ensure the classes have material they need or the machines to work with, who will keep the classes running and deliver the teaching environmental educators and students? We should recognize these people, our CLT and support them during this uncertain times. We are concerned about how we will get back to campus. We need to know that is Administrators will provide enough PPE, especially N95 for our CLT. They will be maintain a safe working environment for our students and faculty, CLC and staff. We want to know what steps will be taken to ensure member safety. And we want to enroll determine those steps. How will they will arrange and maintain social distance in our lab when men are usually are crowded? How we continue to ensure enforcement of hygiene and safety environment in our lab. We can work together, assess these problems, creating solutions that we can quickly agree on and work in steps to change the implement across campuses. I thank you very much. I will voice my members for the higher education committee to speak up 
of their health and safety, CUNY workers and continue to employ CUNY much precious workers. Thank you. The next panelist will be Monica Courtney. You may begin. Good afternoon, Chairperson Barron and members of the Higher Education Committee. My name is Monica Courtney, and I've been an adjunct lecturer in the English Language Center at LaGuardia Community College in Queens for the past 41 years. If you've had to learn English as an adult or have experienced the disequilibrating process of adapting to life in a different country, not as a tourist, not in a resort, but as a hardworking adult living in a place like Queens, working in one of the service industries, saving money to study English and eventually get a college degree, you may understand who my students are. This is the face of a typical ESL student that I've been fortunate enough to teach. The English Language Center at LaGuardia was founded in 1971 and has grown to become the largest ESL program on the East Coast and the second largest ESL program in the United States with over 80 countries represented by our students. And our students are as diverse as Queens. As instructors, we witness transformation due to their learning language on, an, on a regular basis. We see fear give way to confidence, reticence to critical thinking, insular notions about the world and others to openness, compassion, and reflection. It's pure joy. Instructors in the English Language Center are highly experienced, all with advanced degrees. As, and are as passionate about teaching as I am. On behalf of our students and the approximately 60 instructors in the English Language Center, all of whom are adjuncts or continuing ed teachers, I'm asking for your help and your intervention. The current pandemic has dealt a gut-wrenching blow to our ESL students. Many have no families in the United States and even more have been unemployed since New York City shut down 13 weeks ago. The English Language Center at LaGuardia is a self-funded tuition-based program. In better times, it's been described as a cash cow for the college. Now enrollment has dropped to 20% of what it usually is. And as one of my students said, Monica, if it's a choice between buying food and paying tuition, I gotta pay for food. Of the almost $13 million in federal stimulus funds allotted to LaGuardia Community College, the English Language Center will receive nothing ostensibly because of its designation as a continuing education program. This is a travesty. How can a community college supposedly dedicated to serving the hardworking students who aspire to do more shut its doors in the face of their desire for growth and opportunity? TELC has survived innumerable political and economic crises. And while I'm hoping that history will repeat itself, this time we need help. Students who can't attend classes flounder we will lose our jobs, our health insurance, and the knowledge of contributing to a greater good. Please help get funding for TELC. We're a much better world when we support each other's strengths. All right. Thank you. The next panelist will be Sylvia Gonzalez. You may begin. Good afternoon, everyone. I am Sylvia Gonzalez, an adjunct lecturer at the English Language Center at LaGuardia Community College. I've been teaching there for the past 25 years. In this testimony, I would like to give you a brief history of what TELC is and what it has meant for the immigrant community and foreign students we serve in one of the most diverse boroughs of the uh, in the country. English language classes were first offered at LaGuardia Community College in the fall of 1971 in the school's first year of existence. Dean Ann Marcus brought a small group of ESL teachers to the new college and had Dr. Don Byard of Queens College come to do formal observations. In 1972, Dr. Byard, who was hired full-time at LaGuardia and later became its first full professor, set up the English Language Center, which comprised credit and non-credit courses for students needing intensive work in college writing. Other skills were offered to support writing. At this time, there was simply no distinction, salary or otherwise, between teachers hired to teach credit and non-credit courses. Dr. Byard wanted experienced people with a master's degree in ESL, and he got them. LaGuardia had a great location, poised just outside Manhattan, yet in the most ethnically diverse borough of this world city. Students were the very best, immigrants and children of immigrants, eager to realize the American dream and ready to work hard to master English. 
With the approval of the college president, Joseph Schenker and Dean Marcus, Dr. Bayard assembled TELC, a TELC administration of ESL professionals already well established elsewhere. Gloria Gallengain, Larry Anger, Alice Osman, Mary Hines and others. They came to LaGuardia because of a lifetime commitment to this student population and because the college and Dr. Bayard offer a chance to build the biggest and best ESL program in the East, which at the 1979 New York TESOL convention received an award for excellence usually reserved for individuals. The credit part of the program fully realized in 1974 by Gloria Gallengain and Mary Hines was originally part of the reading department, but was moved to continuing education in 1976. It was felt that full-time ESL professionals would add weight to continuing ed and benefit the highly diverse student population as well. Professor Gallengain succeeded, succeeded Dr. Byard as head of the English Language Center in 1979 79, and remained in that position until her retirement in 1990. At peak, there were four levels of credit, ESL, originally called FESL, Freshman English as a Second Language, and 12 levels of non-credit ESL in five different programs tailored to accommodate the schedules of busy working people, as well as more available foreign students. The program was known as the best program at the best price. The non-credit students pulled out their checks, cash and money orders and line up all the way to elevators on registration day. The program was able to maintain, has been able to maintain a substantial enrollment in the day intensive program throughout the decades prior to this COVID-19 uh, crisis. This was due simply, uh, this was due to a simple pattern. Agents, status and benefits attract and hold the best teachers, the quality of teaching and the reasonable tuition attract students. The English Language Center has contributed substantially to the income of LaGuardia Community College. Thank you. Thank you. Before I announce the next panel, are there any council members questions? If so, please use the Zoom raise hand function. I wanna thank this panel for their presentation and uh, I understand and appreciate and support all the work that adjuncts do. And certainly they're the oil that keeps things running and makes sure that everything is prepared and has in fact many of the, uh, much of the direct contact with students. So we appreciate you. We are trying to support you and move forward to make sure that we use this opportunity to in fact force CUNY, the city and the state to look at where they need to put their resources, put their money and bring a, a better alignment of, of the reflection of what it is that adjuncts do. We certainly support you and encourage you and uh, pray that you continue to be involved with students. We know you're not doing it for the money because the money is not reflective of the time that you put in, but we do thank you so much for coming and sharing your testimony. And the council can call them, you're welcome. The, thank, the council can call, uh, the next panel, please. Thank you. Before I call the next and last panel, if we inadvertently missed anyone that would like to testify, please use the Zoom raise hand function and we will call on you after the next panel in the order in which your hand is raised. Thank you. The next panel will be Lakeisha Williams, followed by Lena Hayes. Ms. Williams, you may begin when the sergeant cues you. You may begin now. Good afternoon. Um, we submitted our testimony electronically, and it is a um, combination of a bunch of our students' testimonies from Degrees NYC, which is a collective impact initiative here in New York City. But it definitely reflects everything that has been said regarding the remote learning experience that our students and some of the faculty, the staff have experienced. Um, and then we also have a list of recommendations that we have attached to the bottom. But um, students, as we said in our um, submitted te uh, testimony, students are calling for um, more mental health support, more basic need support, tuition breaks, remote teaching, um, help from for, for professors and for staff, also better equipment, 
and also meaningful work and assignments and not just busy work, but also they would like um, office hours from their professors and they would also like to make sure that the the university is listening to what they are saying. A lot of our students have had COVID experiences directly. They've had family members pass, and they've also had the experience of having to take care of siblings who are also um, experiencing remote learning from um, uh, at, at the um, elementary or the K-12 level. So the stress levels are very high. Also, the remote learning experiences have not been the best and they would just like for the university to pay attention to what they are saying and not just give lip service in public. Thank you, I yield my time. Thank you. The next panelist will be Lena Hayes followed by Enrique Pena Oropesa. You may begin. Thank you. Good morning, Chairperson Barron and members of the committee. My name is Lena Hayes. I'm a former employee of LaGuardia Community College Adult and Continuing Ed in the Workforce Education Center, which administered the Summer Youth Employment Program for 3,500 youth annually. The Workforce Education Center employed 16 full-time staff and one part-time staff person. 15 of us were terminated due to canceling this critical program. The staff at LaGuardia Community College we're diligently working from home to research online platforms to transfer our project-based learning curriculum for younger youth to virtual learning, as well as brainstorming and creating online opportunities for older youth. We had staff that are trauma-informed and aimed to embed additional mindfulness and restorative justice exercises to help the participants deal with the new reality of a COVID-19 world. Within 24 hours, that was all gone. It seemed like our efforts and work were not shown any respect or valued. In the meantime, the mayor encouraged businesses not to lay off employees. We were the first to go April 8th because he did not honor our contract. I have personally kept up hope by engaging with Teens Take Charge and staying connected with former coworkers and continuing my advocacy for, co advocacy for coworkers and youth. Many of the SYEP participants have gone on to do great things, some to do ordinary things in extraordinary ways. The loss of SYEP specifically at LaGuardia denies thousands of youth the opportunity to have their work experience connected to college. For some, it has helped to demystify the college experience by engaging and therefore enrolling in LaGuardia. One of my personal youth was a young man that relocated to New York from Florida, but ended up living in a shelter. He came to us as a vulnerable youth, successfully worked retail and worked at LaGuardia and enrolled at LaGuardia, excuse me. He sat out one semester due to finances, but came back to our SYEP staff and we assisted him in negotiating a payment plan so he could re-enroll. There was a young woman from a Jamaican immigrant family. She enrolled in a DYCD funded program, applied and enrolled at LaGuardia Community College, participated in SYEP several years while she attended school there. She went on to transfer to Emory College on a full scholarship and now works for Google. And finally, the value of SYEP at LaGuardia is ultimately shown by a young man that is currently an EMT. He worked through SYEP from age 14 to 21. He was referred and accepted at LaGuardia's EMT program and graduated last August. Working in SYEP put him in a position to possibly save lives. COVID-19 has stolen enough from our city. Please don't let it steal this summer's employment and learning opportunities from the youth. Support the reinstatement of SYEP funding this summer so that we can ensure the continued employment opportunities and support for New York City youth and families at LaGuardia. For many, this is the first work experience and a chance to assist their families financially. Now more than ever, these opportunities are needed to keep youth engaged, prevent isolation, loneliness, further trauma, and possible unwanted interactions with law enforcement. If the Department of Education can turn on the dime and create online education, surely we can demand the Department of Youth and Community Development right. to support provider agencies like LaGuardia Community College to do the same with project-based learning and online employment training embedded with mental health. Thank you. Thank you. And the last panelist for today will be Enrique Pena Oropesa. You may begin. All right. I uh, just want to start by saying, uh, Chairwoman Barron, uh, I heard you had COVID, uh, so seeing you today makes me really happy. Um, good morning, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, 
My name is Enrique Peña Oropesa. I'm a student at Queens College, a uh, triple major in political science, urban studies, and Latin American studies. I'm a USS delegate. Uh, I'm a dreamer, and I always like to point out that I am a proud New Yorker just like anyone else this call. Uh, I am an immigrant from Peru. Uh, since I was a kid, my parents taught me the value of education. That's why I love CUNY so much and have dedicated so much time advocating. So it not only stays the way it is, but improves and it's invested in. Yet this same city that has one of the most segregated school systems in the country, we keep this investing in public college system that kids that look like me rely on to get an opportunity. I am here once again after I don't know how many times with the same ask to invest in CUNY. Uh, about two months ago, all my family got the coronavirus. My dad and I had already lost our jobs since the pandemic started and neither of us qualified for any city, state or federal aid or unemployment status. And by the beginning of April, we were both hospitalized with pneumonia. I don't know how many of you can relate to this, but I assure you it's not comforting to be asked to sign a document as you get into a hospital, authorizing them to try to resuscitate you and your dad if things get worse. But I made it out after a week and my dad after a month. On top of worrying about issues with the process to clear my immigration status and calling my dad in the hospital every day to check his progress and having to be strong for my mom who has a brain tumor and that has caused her depression for years, I had the responsibility to inquire anywhere possible about any support to pay for rent and get basic stuff to eat. But during that time, I got an email from CUNY not to talk to me about emergency funds that I could apply to since the chancellor's fund was way too restrictive. And just like every person I know, I didn't qualify for it or the local emergency funds since they're mostly funded with student activity fees. And the state government has a provision that even though I pay those fees, I can't get any, get any of that money. So it wasn't that either. What was it? the last payment due of my tuition, the one that took the last money I had saved and the same tuition that the Board of Trustees is yet planning to increase again next year that I'm not sure how I'm gonna be able to attend. This is no way to live. I have friends that are fighting administration today at Queens College that are being evicted from the dorms in the middle of a pandemic for not being able to make ends meet. I have friends teaching in many CUNY campuses that are amazing in their classes that either already got a non-reappointment letter or, ex or are expecting one soon because CUNY still considers actions as expendable and plans to leave them with no job security. And in most cases, as they won't be teaching, they lose their health insurance also in the middle of a pandemic. Actions are the heart of CUNY and should be protected. Having those professors not reappointed also means that I will lose some of my classes I enrolled in the fall. And yet another barrier for me and any other student that won't graduate on time Hi. because we can't find the classes we need to fulfill requirements. Um, I, have, I am here today because I have the responsibility to do so. I can no longer stand when the crisis hits, the first cuts are on education, while the NYPD, the, the same law enforcement that criminalizes my peers and I, gets the special treatment and a budget that is bigger than the entire budget of the city of Houston, the fourth biggest city in the country. CUNY, my American dream is being gutted in front of our eyes, and I ask you to do something about it before it's too late. It's time to fund CUNY, not the police, investing education, not our criminalization. And to my action comrades, I stand in solidarity with you and Black Lives Matter. Thank you so much. I want to thank this panel for their presentation. And yes, we are fighting for restoration of so many of the programs. Uh, you mentioned SYEP, that's a part of what we're fighting for as well. And, and again, I wanna say, we don't wanna pit one program against the other. What we're saying is that there are other areas that we, where we can look to find how we can make cuts that don't have direct impact on the programs that our students need. And as has been said, uh, this COVID virus is not gone. It's not over. I've done some reading about previous pandemics and traditionally, there's a resurgence, a reemergence when the fall comes. I think that all of the issues that you have raised are pertinent and need to be a part of, of the consideration of making a responsive plan to what it is. I don't think we can think that, okay, it's gonna go away and we're gonna start and we're gonna pick up where we left off. That's not gonna be the case, I don't think. So we've got to make sure that all of the issues that you raise have an opportunity to be discussed, to be fleshed out, 
to be considered and to be reflected in a comprehensive plan moving forward to make sure that we continue to offer the programs, the services, and the instruction in a responsible way and with the faculty and staff that we need to make sure that students are recognized and that students get all of the support that they need moving forward beyond just what the academics is. And I think particularly the mental health issues that have been touched on briefly here uh, are critical because this is going to be far reaching beyond whatever the end of the pandemic is. It is going to be far reaching and have those long, long standing uh, impact. So I want to thank all of you for your testimony here today. And if the council does not have anything further in terms of uh, council members or other panels, if there's nothing further, then we will consider this hearing adjourned. Thank you so much. Thank you.